perfect. So thanks, thanks uh, to you all for joining this uh, this actually first time that we're having a satellite event uh, coming with the uh, with the Sofa Week. Uh, so the Sofa Week is a, an annual event that we are organizing around the open source project that we have uh, called Sofa. Uh, and to open this week, we're going to talk about the Driven project that most of you must be aware of. And if not, you're going to discover that through five main presentations. Format will be the format of those presentations will be a bit longer than it will be tomorrow for the for the symposium. It will be twenty minutes or so, twenty minutes of presentation and more or less and and, and ten minutes of uh, of question time for for the for for the speakers. So the driven project you'll you'll see it's uh, many things around data driven simulation on actually various topics. Uh, so it's uh, for today uh, today afternoon Monday Monday twenty second. That's for the program. So we're, we're going to start with a, with a few words of uh, of Stefan for opening and introduction uh, introducing actually the the, the driven project. Well, we're going to have two uh, two presentations, one from Johan, one from Alban, uh, and and uh, then a short break, and then we'll restart. Uh, depending on, on the timing, maybe we'll we'll shorten the break, a bit the break if, if needed, and then we'll restart with a presentation on FEM from uh, Pierre Yves, uh, soft robotics with Olivier, and finally uh, Jakub will uh, will conclude uh, on uh, on programmable matter that can help mimic life. So uh, I'll let you the floor, uh, Stefan, for a few words of introduction, and then we'll we'll let uh, Johan start his uh, presentation. Okay, thank. You. Thank you so much. I hope I'm sharing the right thing. Yeah, I think it's working. Yeah, we do see your screen. Okay, now try that and see if it also works. All right, so I'll try to play it full screen. It may fail. <clears throat> That's perfect. Does it work? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Please go ahead. Okay, so thank you. You go for introduction introducing the driven satellite workshop into sofa week so we are november 22nd 2021 and um, so what driven talks about is uh, essentially beyond data driven biomechanics it deals with data driven period so the idea being that we would like to solve partial differential equations where we assume that we have some knowledge about the solution to the problem but we also assume that we have some information or data that's coming into the, the solution process in order to refine our knowledge about the problem or to refine the solution itself. So uh, this is an example of, uh, well, what you can get from data driven. So in that case, we were at the European Investment Bank conference in 2019 and you see Sorry, Stefan, it's, it's my fault. I muted your mic. Sorry. Could you unmute your mic? Stefan? I misclicked. Yeah, if you... <laughs> Stefan, I don't know if you can, if you can hear us. Uh, could you just uh, 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 get back to the to the WebEx uh, interface and just unmute yourself because you've, you've got uh, mismuted. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Should, yeah, should have only to uh, accept and get back to you. Okay. Yeah, Is perfect. We can hear you back. Yeah. Unmute. Thanks. Ah, okay. It got muted. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sorry, my okay. bad. No, it's okay. So what I was saying was, yeah, that we are, so in the Driven project, first of all, the Driven project is a twinning project. So the idea of twinning is that we, we link a country which has a lot to learn in terms of research and development to countries that have already quite a lot of experience. In that case, Luxembourg is the learning countries, country and France, Ireland and the US are the uh, experienced countries. So we teamed up with Enria, the team of Stéphane Cotin, Mimesis, and we teamed up with the team of uh, Limerick in the field of, um, of mechanics of composites. So this is the team of Paul Weaver. 
And then uh, the idea uh, was to develop on um, three strands. One is the fundamental developments in mathematical theory of data-driven modeling, such as model order reduction, data assimilation, neural networks, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on. To then team up on the direction of composite materials and materials in general, and finally in the field of biomechanics. So it happens that uh, INRIA was both in the fundamental development area, which means uh, artificial intelligence, and on the biomechanics applications, obviously, with the team of Stéphane Cotin and surgical simulation and similar topics. So, uh, the, so that, that is the setting. So the idea is for Luxembourg to learn from advanced partners such as the ones that we listed uh, today. And the whole point of the project is to perform exchanges of staff and students between the different nodes of the network, which includes also the Oden Institute in, uh, in Texas. So that's the, that's the setting. So what we've been doing is trying to uh, leverage this project as well as we could in order to deliver impact in the fields of biomechanics and composite materials using fundamental developments in the mathematical um, framework, com computer science, and more core themes. So again, the idea is the following, and this is a slide that is um, borrowed from another driven project, which this one is a doctoral training center led by Andreas Zillian. And the idea is, and funded by the Fonds National de la Recherche du Luxembourg, FNR, and uh, the key point here is that we typically have data and we have an output and in the middle we have a model and the model is represented by this function f the input is the data x and the output is the solution y uh, sometimes the structure of f is known but its parameters are not known in which case you need to calibrate the model so this is typically what you do if you think that you know that uh, a brain behaves like a hyper elastic octane material and you want to find all the coefficients that are associated with this material model so in that case you assume the model is correct and then you try to calibrate the model and so therefore you have pdes partial differential equations maybe they are coupled maybe not and then your goal is to try to figure out what parameters should be used in order to get this partial differential equation to predict something about your system. The other extreme would be um, in the case where you have only data, but very little information about the system. So therefore, you do not know what the model F is. So you have on, only very little information, if only any, maybe none at all. So for example, uh, an extreme case of that would be trying to predict the behavior of people on Instagram based on previous behavior of people on Instagram. Or it could be trying to predict neuron firing in the brain of uh, a worm, like you're seeing here on the, uh, on the photograph below. So in that case, you have no idea about F, and your goal is to identify the best model, or any model for that matter, that may predict anything useful about your system. And what's uh, really uh, interesting is that in the driven project, we are really in the middle between those two extremes. So if you take an example of a, of a brain, this is work of Paul Ozeu when he was here um, on my ERC grounds a, a few years back. And uh, we were asking ourselves, what is the influence of certain parameters of, of let's say, a Neo-Hookian model on the behavior of the brain uh, on their load? And so we, you know, Paul decided to work on random fields, so he randomized some of these uh, coefficients, C1, and uh, he worked with uh, Jack Hale on the implementation of that in Phoenix, which will come back later, I guess, in the discussion, because Phoenix was recently coupled to SOFA. This is quite, quite new stuff. And then the idea was, okay, we have an initial target, which is this, let's say target for removal or target for deep brain stimulation or something else. And after brain shift or motion of the brain, let's call it this way, the deformed point is slightly to the left. And the idea was for Paul to predict what would be the 95% confidence interval of the position of this target, because of course you're not sure about much, but in that case we were kind of sure that the suitable model was the model we used. And we wanted to see the influence of the parameters on the output of interest. And this is what Paul did. So he was on the left-hand side of the chart of the previous uh, slide. Um, so he was on the left here in model calibration. All right, so if we are uh, 
doing biomechanics or composite materials with sensing data being, uh, let's say, provided on the fly, typically we start with a model that we know and we may make hypotheses like Newton did about the general law of, um, of gravitation. We make hypotheses. Like, for example, we say the brain is going to be isotropic and homogeneous. We may think this is correct for the, the applications that we have. And then we write a PDE and we solve, and then we see if we compare well to experiments and perhaps we do like Paul, we look at statistical deviations around some mean with a standard deviation. So that's the left-hand side extreme. And as data is being acquired, and that could be done through imaging, could be done through video cameras. And we were strongly inspired by the, um, the team of Stefan Cotin this uh, in Mimesis because they, they have uh, extremely nice papers on uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Haushin on uh, actually how to use data as you measure it using some sort of visualization, could be cameras or could be, could be something else. And then the question is, how do you move from the left to the right? And at the moment, there are several students that are working at the interface between the team in Luxembourg and the team in, in RIA. One is uh, Alban, who is working currently at uh, uh, in Strasbourg. And the other is Saurabh Deschpande, as well as Arnaud Mazier as well. And uh, two interns from LMT Cachan, uh, Thomas Lavigne and uh, one of his uh, teammates who will join us soon. And they are working at trying to see how they can use the data that is mo that is measured in order to enrich the hypothesis based model that was set in stone at the beginning of the calculation and to do that they start by running in silico simulations in order to drive the model so they assume that the data and on the right hand side here is coming from in silico information not from measurement information yet at least that's what sarah is doing and then the next step will be to try to merge th that information with real measured data. And that's going to be the next challenge. So basically, that's what we're trying to do. And uh, personally, I think it's uh, super exciting because whether we are in a small data or the big data extreme, uh, we will be able, hopefully, if all that works properly, to have an, an adaptive framework which will be able to go more to the the left if more information is is known and more to the right if less is no, sorry more to the left if little information is known and more to the right if more information is is given to the system so that's basically the um the point of the work that uh, that we are doing here and uh, i'm very happy that we we have the chance of having uh, very very experienced speakers uh, after uh, after me uh, in order to actually shed light on some of these uh, um, discussions. So the next speaker will be uh, Johan Payon, and Johan is extremely uh, well known in the field of biomechanics. I, I won't introduce him because I would then otherwise do... <laughs> do, do um, yeah, anyway, take too much time for this. Um, then we will have uh, Alban, and then there will be a break, uh, and Pierre Ivron will talk more uh, about actually how to deal with the left-hand side of the spectrum by identification of material parameters. And um, Olivier will be a, a bit more to the right with modeling and control of application and applications. And um, finally, Jakub will be talking about programmable matter uh, in order to see if there is a way to mimic life using robots. And that would be exactly in the middle, I believe, between hypothesis-based model and data-driven models, because you're talking about a self-reinforcing and self-controlled uh, system. And that's it. I'm done with my introduction. Uh, I'm sorry if it took a bit longer than it should. We have, we have uh, anyway uh, uh, a break that, that is moderable uh, so that uh, so that we can uh, play with the time a bit. Thanks a lot for uh, for introducing uh, introducing the, the driven project. So Jan, I'll let you the floor to present uh, to present your work. You should be able to now present I and mean, share and and present your presentation. I mean highlight your presentation. Okay. Let Thank me know you. If any issue? So yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, can you see my team C? Yeah. Can you see my 
Not yet. Not yet, but it should, maybe it's going to take a few seconds. OK. Uh, I do not see it for the moment. I don't know. Uh, you can, can see, see so I will start again. Mm -hmm. Now I see things moving, so it would work in a, uh, here. Yeah, perfect. You can see your screen, your presentation. Thanks. It's okay. Okay, yeah, thanks. thanks. Thank you very much. So thanks, uh, thanks, Stefan, for the introduction. Thanks, Hugo, and, and all your colleagues, uh, Catherine and Arno, uh, for this uh, for this invitation. Um, as um, as Stefan said, so I, I'm from uh, from Gwenham, So the name of the lab is Team Seats. Um, for, for those of you uh, who don't know where Gonal is located, it's the southeast of, um, of France and near the French uh, Alps. And, and I'm belonging to this lab, uh, which name is Team C, which is a quite large lab uh, that gathers close to 300 people uh, around the topics on technology for health, generally speaking. Uh, and more particularly, uh, I'm in charge of um, the team, which name is Biomeca team for, for biomechanics, uh, which uh, mainly focus on biomechanics of human soft tissues and, and materials. And it's a kind of, uh, I would say, transversal uh, team uh, uh, trying to work uh, uh, from basic research to, to clinical research with uh, uh, medical device and medical application in, in the field of biomechanics mainly, so which, uh, which means um, uh, if it goes, yeah, uh, from, from the from the design of um, the proposal for original constitutive laws to the transfer of medical uh, device into uh, a medical application, um, uh, passing through experiment and experimental mechanics and, and numerical uh, simulations. So I will uh, mainly focus on um, topics on the right. I mean, the question of, of, of computational model and their transfer into clinical uh, application um, during this um, during this uh, this talk uh, and if I tried for actually I tried for this uh, presentation to to gather in a slide uh, the main um, I would say the main organs that are currently uh, uh, concerned by by uh, the work of, of my uh, students and I've listed here the PhD the actual uh, the current and formal PhD student who work on different uh, uh, I, I would say active uh, modeling uh, uh, project uh, those days. So uh, of course I won't go into the details of those uh, projects, but the idea is that from, for example, modeling of brain uh, tissue to try to compensate for brain shift during surgery, to the biomechanical modeling of the foot uh, to in order to predict the risk for pressure ulcer for diabetic uh, foot uh, people. So each time the objective is yeah, to, to, to focus on a given organ, try to make it uh, subject specific to be able to help the, the surgeon, the clinician in his uh, clinical uh, practice. Uh, so uh, coming back to the title, um, to be fair, actually this title was uh, was proposed by, uh, by um, uh, Stefan and, and his uh, colleagues. Um, to me, and, and to be fair, when I saw it, I said, oh, what, what could I say about that? Um, uh, so, uh, what, what does it mean, setting the scene for biomech? And it's a very large title. So, I try to, um, to address this question um, with the, the A of, of uh, I mean, um, to which extent biomechanics today is, is in practice used by clinicians? Um, uh, and to try to address this question, I try to look at, in, in my domain, I mean, from, from what we do in, in, in our lab, try to look at all the, the companies that were uh, created by the lab in, in the field of, of computer-assisted medical intervention. You can see them in the, uh, on, on the screen. And, and in this field of computer-assisted medical intervention, since uh, a bit more than um, 20 years, um, we, we have participated to the creation of about 15 uh, spin-off um, uh, companies. And looking at them, so each of them addressing a specific uh, a clinical uh, uh, um, uh, domain. Um, by looking at them and, and trying to see whether uh, for those, the corresponding medical device, there was some biomechanics involved um, in the device. Actually, very few of them, only 
two of them, uh, Texas Sense, uh, which deals with uh, pressure cell prevention, and Twin Sight, which uh, deals with uh, musculoskeletal uh, skeletal, uh, biomechanics. Only two of them really uh, based, I mean, their, their medical uh, devices, their products on, on biomechanics, which is actually quite few. Um, so um, then coming back to this, uh, to this question of setting the scene for biomechanics, I wanted to address uh, the, uh, the the other sub question that was why why is it so difficult today to transfer what I call the biomechanical modeling framework into the clinical practice? Uh, I will I will come back on, on, onto this notion of biomechanical modeling framework, but and um, the to try to address this question. The underlying question I will try to address during my my talk is what are the main difficulties? What are the bottlenecks? Face today by such uh, biomechanical uh, modeling frame framework that would explain why there are so few uh, 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 biomechanical models uh, used in practice by uh, by, by clinicians in, in their clinical uh, routine. Um, so uh, then, coming back to what we are currently doing, uh, when I, I look at them, uh, all of those biomechanical models, actually, it's quite what some of my uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, uh, here today in the audience, called uh, in France, uh, biomechanics à la papa. It's a French expression. I, I, I don't know how to translate it in English. Maybe I could say old fashioned uh, biomechanics or quite simple biomechanics because it's a, it's, it's a biomechanics uh, looked at, at a single scale. It's what usually we call mesoscale, so modeling between micro and macro uh, scale. So no, no multiscale at all. Uh, it's simple framework of uh, hyperelasticity. And for most uh, models that we are developing, uh, we are in a static framework. For some of them, quasi-static, for some rare model dynamic framework, but most of them is too static. So looking at this from quite far away from a scientific point of view, we can we can see that it's a quite simple uh, biomechanics, what, I, what, what my colleagues and I, I usually call it biomechanics a la papa. So even with this kind of biomechanics, why uh, why there are so, so few uh, uh, applications and products in terms of, of biomechanics? So uh, to try to respond to this question, I think we, we need to target three points. First, we need to, to be uh, cautious about uh, the way we propose such models to, to our scientific community, community because uh, as you know, uh, before being accepted by a clinician, uh, a model or I mean a modeling framework needs to be accepted by the scientific community. This is the first point. Then, of course, we have to convince our co clinician colleague that such model can be useful uh, and can be integrated in the routine clinical practice. And finally, last but not least, uh, industrial, I mean, companies need to define and to find a kind of business model for such uh, framework. So um, starting with the, 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 the main point that is interesting to us, which is the acceptation of such model in the scientific community, I, I really like this uh, recent um, uh, proposal from uh, the team uh, colleagues of Erdemir to try to list uh, 10 tools uh, for what they call credible practice of modeling and simulation in healthcare. Uh, I of course, I won't go into the details of those um, 10 rules, but um, I, I really encourage you to look at these interesting papers because they really uh, list all the points that, uh, I mean, we should try to follow when we try to design such kind of modeling uh, tool from, from the definition of the context to the uh, confirmation to standards. Uh, the point I just wanted to spend a bit more time is the, the, the first point, third point, uh, I know that is uh, um, very important for, for the team of, of Stefan and for this driven project, which is the, uh, the importance of performing verification, validation, uncertainty, quantification, and sensitive analysis of the model uh, with respect to the reality of interest uh, uh, and the intended uh, uses of models or, or simulation. This is, of course, very uh, important. It's, it's important for the, for the work, but it's also important for any uh, any modeling work to be accepted by the by, by our community and to illustrate this i wanted to to show you the to, to tell you the example of of what we have uh, what was designed in terms of policy of of the journal clinical biomechanics uh, which is with a 
journal of biomechanics, one of the main journals in the field of, of, uh, of biomechanics, and for which I am the, the um, uh, associate editor for soft tissue mechanics. If you if you look at the at the uh, guidelines for OCHER uh, that we propose uh, in our policy, uh, it's explicitly uh, stated that uh, uh, the journal has strict requirements uh, on model valid validation uh, and verification also, but I just uh, copy here the, the question in terms of, of evaluation validation of the of the of the models referring to this uh, well-known papers of, of the team of vc20 uh, again back to this notion of of, of, uh, of verification and validation and again uh, quick very quickly but i guess most of you are aware of this uh, looking at this uh, a graph from the recent uh, paper for, from from anderson uh, the idea that yeah uh, for any reality and, and a Approximation of this reality with a conceptual model. We have from one side that all, all this uh, uh, modeling uh, framework I, I'm talking about, uh, with this question of verif verification that I will uh, detail just after this slide. Uh, and in parallel, of course, all this question of, of, uh, of validation, which consists in, in comparing some, some reality of experimental and physical modeling with the uh, result of the, of the simulation. This is uh, uh, extremely important and, and, and unfortunately, um, uh, very frequently um, uh, ignored, I mean, in the writing of the paper, ignored by most of, of our colleagues. And that's why I wanted to insist on, on that point uh, during this uh, uh, talk in terms of uh, acceptability of the model. Uh, uh, and coming back to those notions, uh, very, very uh, simply uh, speaking, we could say that validation uh, try to answer to the question: Are we uh, are we solving the right equation? Whether uh, verification is the question? Uh, are we solving the question right? Um, concerning this question of, of verification, I really like this illustration again from the team of Erdemir to try to illustrate the importance of, of looking uh, just at one part of the verification, which is the the the, the definition of the size of the mesh of the finite in the case of finite element modeling here. So, uh, which is called in terms of, of, of a mesh conversion study. What is interesting here in, in the case of, of knee modeling, so it's a, it's a knee with ligament force exactly on the knee, um, you have uh, two graphs here. Looking at, at the top, you can see that according to the size of the mesh, you can see the conversion study in terms of ligament force. So if, if you are just looking at the ligament force, you don't need a very dense mesh. Only a mesh with a few elements is sufficient to provide a uh, right uh, to, to solve uh, the question rightly. On the contrary, if you look at the big uh, stress, then uh, it's clearly shown that you need much more elements to be accurate. I mean, to, to solve in the right way the equation. So um, uh, it, it is this, this point illustrates the importance of, of looking at, at this, uh, at this uh, verification step and looking with the uh, important quantity of interest that will be uh, studied during the, the, the publication, for example. For example. Okay, so so now uh, if I come back to this question uh, concerning the, the, the difficulties of bottlenecks uh, faced by uh, by biomechanical modeling frameworks, I think um, I would like to to list three main uh, difficulties that we still face even with this uh, biomechanics a, a la papa. Uh, the first um, bottleneck is the way, so it comes back to the importance of data, the way we can get uh, the subject or patient-specific geometry. Uh, of course, we cannot work with generic models. Uh, if you want to transmit, transfer, sorry, or work into the clinical world, we need to be patient-specific by definition. So the first one concerning the geometry of the of the patient-specific model is, is not so obvious because, uh, as most of you know, building a model of a given organ of a given subject takes time, and clinicians don't have time. So, so we, since many uh, years, we have uh, proposed um, um, a methodology that we call mesh matching or mesh morphing uh, more than 20 years ago, and we with this idea that uh, a generic uh, finite element model is going to be built once on what we call the uh, a reference subject, and then this model is will be automatically adapted to any new subject, any new patient uh, geometry, thanks to what is called image registration. So I, I will try to to illustrate this uh, on this example on, on tongue modeling. 
um, here uh, with an illustration of a tongue model that was uh, defined in our group many years ago on a single uh, reference subject. So from MRI data of this subject through the MRI, we did classical uh, tongue segmentation. And then from the segmentation, we construct the volume, then mesh, and then define the mesh with boundary condition. All, all in internal substructure like like muscle, different muscle, but 15 muscle in the tongue. All this work took months to be designed on a given reference tongue model. And then the, the idea of this methodology that for, for any new subject or any new patient, the idea is to try to automatically uh, deform the uh, reference 3D uh, volume, uh, in that case, MRI volume of the reference subject, to deform it into the 3D MRI volume of, of this new subject. And to do it automatically, thanks to this notion of 3D image resolution, which is, a, um, um, of course, the main field of uh, image uh, processing. Uh, I won't go into the detail, but the idea that uh, based on the uh, level of gray level of, of, of voxel, we are able to compute uh, to optimize the, this kind of 3D displacement field to, to, to morph those two volumes. Uh, so the, in that case, if we look at this example here, here at the middle, you can see the transform of the uh, reference subject to be morphed uh, onto the 3D uh, subject uh, volumes. So you can see that this image is, is quite close to the actual reality of the subject. Uh, so we have given accuracy. And then the idea is that by computing this T transform, we can now use this T transform not to transform not only the, the 3D MRI volume, but also to transform the 3D mesh with the node, with its nodes. So to automatically get a new geometry of the 3D finite element mesh of the reference object to be to generate a subject specific 3D F image that is adapted to the contours of the tone um, of this 3D uh, MRI volume of the subject. So this is a general concept. I won't have time to go into the detail, but it could be uh, applied to any kind of any kind of any organs and any kind of, of 3D volume. We, we are just for, for kind of funny illustration, we also applied it recently on the tongue of a very specific subject, which is a baboon, actually. I want to detail the project, but the idea that in the same methodology, we can try to automatically uh, transform the baboon 3D volume into the reference subject volume. The, here is the result of the transform, and then automatically generate the 3D tongue shape, finite element mesh of the, of the baboon. So in, in the same way, we were able to compute the 3D deformation of the tongue due to muscle activation on the reference subject, we can also, uh, just by the same uh, uh, macro command, uh, directly uh, get the 3D deformation of the tongue, baboon tongue, uh, using the same uh, concept of, of, of uh, mesh matching or mesh morphing. Okay, so, so this is the, the, the first uh, question. Uh, of course, this is one option, one, one methodology we propose. That we, other methodology exists, but I wanted to, to, to introduce the one we have developed in, 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 our, in our lab. Uh, it's not finished uh, with this question of, of uh, defining a subject-specific model because, as you know, geometry is not sufficient. We need uh, specific constitutive parameters, uh, as was illustrated by, by Stefan in the introduction. So this is another complex question. Uh, if we stay on the tongue, we could have classical way of doing by, for example, um, using, uh, like in this figure, using tongue specimen extracted from a, a fresh human tongue cadaver. So on which we can do, let's say, for example, here, uh, um, extensive tensile, uh, tensile tests uh, on those tissues in the direction of the, the muscle fibers. And from those uh, experiments, try to get the... Uh, uh, propose a given constitutive law for the tongue tissue, uh, uh, in that case, the muscle uh, of the tongue. But as you probably know, the elasticity parameters of, of Stefan tongue is not the same as the elasticity parameter as, as my tongue. I mean, we have to be subject specific. So we, we, we have no other way of, of being subject specific in the in vivo estimation of the stiffness of the organ, the tongue in that uh, case. So here again, there are some solutions, but not so many. Uh, elastography is one of the solutions. I won't go um, into that direction with also some limitation, but we, we have proposed uh, recently to use um, what we call local uh, in vivo aspiration, which allows, so we did some tests on, uh, on, on patients in our clinical studies to be able to, 
to estimate with a very local uh, aspiration on the tongue surface to estimate local stiffness of tongue tissue that, of course, uh, are different from one subject to another one, which again shows the importance of doing it uh, in vivo. So this is another important question that has to be addressed uh, and, and still faced by uh, people in, in our field. Uh, then uh, I want to finish with the third um, the third uh, uh, bottleneck, I would say, difficulty faced by Balmikian model, uh, which explains how we still do not propose solution to the in that field, which is a question of initial stress. So uh, the, the idea that if I, uh, again, in, uh, illustrate my, my talk on this uh, question of tongue modeling, when, when you get this such kind of MRI volume, uh, um, as you probably know, uh, when we did the exam, the subject was not in that position. Actually, it was uh, in, a, in a supine position. And as you know, uh, during this supine position and during in the uh, during the experiment, uh, the external um, uh, boundary gravity field was exerting, of course. Uh, otherwise, uh, without any uh, uh, gravity, uh, we would not have the same position. So uh, actually, what happens in, in that case? Uh, what we do usually is that uh, by just extracting the external shape of the tongue from those data, we do not take into account the uh, initial stress. And we know, for example, that if we do take, a, let, let, let's say, a rugby player, it's, it's an actuality in France, rugby, uh, uh, when a rugby player is, is not out, uh, it's, it's known that his tongue is going to move and to fall back in, into the pharynx. So without any uh, uh, internal stress due to tongue muscle activity, uh, the tongue shape is not the same. So uh, it's, it's important to know that the organ model defined from the MRI image already includes initial tissue stresses that counterbalance the effect of gravity. And, and most of us don't take in, it into uh, account, which is, which is a fault we do in that case. So let, let me give you another example of the importance of this initial stress. Especially, it's another organ. It's, it's not an active organ with muscle activation like, like the tongue, but it's a passive organ, the breast tissues. But again, when we collect some uh, breast image uh, from, uh, from MRI data, usually it's done in prone position with specific antenna. And from that, we can get a few volume on the mesh. This is quite enough if we want to do this kind of, of modeling with, with simulating uh, mammography uh, in that case. But if you want to model breast tissue and the way breast deformed to, for example, track a tumor inside the breast tissue, then it's another question. And, and, and if you want, for example, you see here the, the, the different kind of breast deformation about, uh, if the subject is in prone supine or tilt supine position, of course, the breast really has very strong different shapes. So that means that we have no other choice that estimating this stress-free initial configuration, which is not that one, not that one, it's another one in between. And from that one, we can then apply gravity and try to compare what the model is going to predict uh, uh, and compare this position with the current data collected in ML. So this shows the, the importance of stress initial configuration in terms of, of, of prediction of the, of the uh, computational model. And, and just to re reinforce the, the, the importance of this initial stress, let me give the last example in, in, uh, in brain, uh, brain modeling. Here, uh, as I said in my introduction, the idea is to model the brain tissues to try to uh, compensate for what is called brain shifts uh, during uh, open uh, craniotomy uh, for, for brain tumor removal. So we need to model the brain tissue. So we could just collect from MRI the external shape of the brain and, and define it as it. But again, it will not take into account the initial uh, stress. So if we want to do that, we need, therefore, to estimate the uh, stress-free configuration of the brain, like here in, in a in wireframe view. Then from that uh, shape of the, of the brain tissue, we then can apply the gravity and, and get the actual shape of the brain that should correspond to the one we collect in the MRI data, which correspond to the uh, initial strep uh, volume, initial stressed volume of the brain, that should be used as a starting point of any kind of simulation there. Uh, just to illustrate this importance of, of taking it to, into account the initial stress, uh, Fanny uh, Morin did this in, in uh, during her PhD. She, she did this uh, funny thing. She, I mean, she took two models. One was a uh, full initial with initial stress model and another one was uh, the same uh, geometry but without any initial stress 
So then, uh, with those two modules, on those two models, she applied a given force field applied uh, on the upper part of the, of the brain, and you can see that uh, she observed almost a double of a displacement uh, on the no without uh, stress versus the pre-stress model. So you can see here the importance of taking into account this initial stress, which is still very uh, uh, difficult and still. Uh, a bottleneck to me uh, again to to try to to disseminate our model in the field. I mean, to to to, to be sure that model uh, try uh, replicate correctly the, the reality of soft tissue. Okay, I was a bit probably a bit too long. Sorry for that. Just to, for for conclusion, I, I wanted to say that uh, this uh, biomechanics a la papa still faces, as you said, bottlenecks that we will have to again to continue to address in in the, the future. And of course, the future, as you will see. Uh, 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 starting this afternoon with very, very nice talks, uh, the future of the mechanics is, is more than this biomechanics alapapa. It, it, it means the biomechanics toward now what we call mechanobiology that will face dynamical multiphysics and of course, mostly scale modeling, but this is another question. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Jan, for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, obviously, so there, there is time for questions. Uh, if you'd like, I mean, we've been, yeah, it was uh, about 30 minutes already, but uh, if some of you have some questions, we can we can take uh, some of uh, some of yours. I, I've prepared some because uh, uh, that's a topic I, I actually, actually uh, quite like here, biomechanical simulation. And I was never myself involved in, in such topics here, but I, I heard the, um, already from a project that was, I think, between Stéphane Cotin's team and also Stéphane Borda's team in Luxembourg, where uh, a, a joint work aimed at evaluating a, a, automatically this uh, initial stress um, using in, uh, an inverse uh, mechanical model. Um, uh, do you have some automatic routine as well? If, if we give you two different shapes and a, a biomechanical model, are you able to automatically output the, the, the initial stress uh, or how does it work? Yeah. So, so I, I think both Stefan would be better uh, than me trying to respond to the question actually because they, they definitely work on that. I, mean, I don't know if you want to answer to that question. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Because I, I remember, uh, so Steph, uh, one of the Stefan do not hesitate to, to, to unmute and, and, and reply. Uh, uh, yeah. So may, maybe I can comment on this because I'm also involved in this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in this kind of activity. Yeah. Uh, now we are working with, uh, together with Arnaud uh, and uh, Thomas Lavigne uh, on a similar topic uh, about uh, modeling of breasts and, and uh, this un unloaded configuration in particular, because it is not unstressed because the body has uh, all sort of uh, eigen stresses, uh, which probably cannot be so easily unloaded. <clears throat> so, I mean, you cannot have a count on st stress-free configuration at any point. So probably we need to talk about uh, unloaded configuration rather than uh, unstressed. And so, so uh, we are working on, on, on in, in that direction. And of course, we are uh, basing upon uh, a paper that is already published in the archive uh, on the formulation that uh, enables us to uh, compute the un unloaded configuration. Sorry, yeah, unloaded configuration uh, when we are having a mechanical model of the, of the tissue. So if we have a, a loaded configuration, as we assume some model and we know the loadings, meaning let's say gravity and some Euclid boundary conditions. We are able to compute uh, the uh, the unloaded configuration under some under some conditions, of course, because uh, there there we don't know whether there, there it will be unique and uh, whether maybe it will be easy to achieve at some difficult cases. So uh, this is uh, one of the area of work that we are following, and uh, we are trying to achieve a bit more involved modeling of uh, of the breast tissue. Um, if possible, but but uh, the work is ongoing, so I, I I cannot say too much detail right now on this. Just a comment. Thanks a lot, Jakub. Uh, there is a, another question waiting from Stefan. From what I see, I have a short question for you, and uh, if time permits, so go go ahead, uh, definitely, Stefan. So uh, we can't hear you for the moment. Let me check here. Yeah, yeah, you you seem unmuted. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you know when when will we hear you. Seems to be muted again. Yeah, 
here unmuted and no, I can't. At least I can't. I don't know if anybody here is no. No, no I, I can't hear uh, Stefan neither. Okay. Uh, in the in the meantime, while while uh, uh, you can you can make uh, some some sound uh, sound test in the in the meantime, I've got a, another question. It, it, it's uh, on the local stiffness evaluation, uh, Johan. Is that a project that, that is leading to some kind of product at the end? Because it would be something that would definitely be interesting for research and I guess for other kind of applications. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, this, this question of, of the user aspiration, it, it, for example, it has been extensively uh, used by uh, the team of uh, Eduardo Mazza in, in Switzerland. And, and they try to, to design a product with a small company. Again, they still face, it, they f still face the, the question of the, of the business model and, and the, the, the kind of product that could be interesting. For sure, uh, my, my feeling that at the moment it's it's, it's quite early to uh, to address this question. I mean, uh, we are still, uh, as I was saying, uh, at the level of of very few uh, product that already includes even very simple uh, uh, model, even with a linear elasticity model. I mean, even this kind of, of biomechanics is uh, very rarely uh, uh, included in medical devices. So, but but I'm I'm really con convinced that uh, I mean all of us know that we will go through this question of digital twins and, and the inclusion of biomechanics in, into the the medical practice. So uh, as soon as this question will be uh, really important and soon as many products will will uh, will exist, then we will need to address this question and to have the possibility to measure in vivo this this stiffness. So uh, I, I think that's a promising tool. Not probably not at the moment. Uh, there are still some limitation of this. As you said, it's a local uh, uh, evaluation, so it only uh, provides some information about a kind of lo local uh, uh, equivalent young modulus at small deformation of, of the tissue. But we still uh, need some other kind of tool. Um, elastography is definitely an interesting um, tool to explore to get information about internal tissue that we cannot uh, just uh, uh, address directly with this kind of device. So it's, it's an open question. Uh, from my yeah, point of view, I, 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 I found it very complementary to elastography because elastography, you know, yeah. you have got those three information, but there is always this question of relative stiffness and so on that you cannot really evaluate. Absolutely. While you could say, okay, starts. I mean, we know that in this region we have some confidence that it's in this kind of range, so you can scale the whole rest of the stiffness evaluation and and have a better better idea of the stiffness. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. I think I think we, we still need first to rely on, on, on ex vivo uh, experimental tests because they are well controlled. I'm talking about uh, tensile tailed, I mean, uniaxial or biaxial, I mean, any kind of experimental test. And this, uh, of course, is done on ex vivo tissue. So we, we know that the viability of in vivo is not here, but at least it gives a kind of range of values. Uh, because if you look at all the models, uh, all the organs, sometimes you can have one, two, or three order of magnitude in stiffness of modeling. So this kind of, of experimental work can give you, can give us the kind of, of, of borders of the intervals. Then when we go to in vivo, I agree with you, and, and often people present some uh, elasticity map of elastography as, as a as absolute value, and we need to be careful because it, it, it's not absolute value. We, to, to my point of view, it only provides a kind of relative value between different parts. So we know, for example, on breast tissue that the, that the breast tumoral region is, a, let's say, a 10 times stiffer than the other soft tissue. But we don't know the real value. And then with local uh, measurement, we could get some adding information that could allow us to be closer to, uh, to the relative value. Thanks a lot. Uh, the question from Stefan, maybe. Uh... We'll see. So is yeah. he back? Are you back, Stefan? Uh, no. I thought I could hear you, but no, no, no. I I, I thought I heard a, a noise, but uh, I mean a, a sound of voice. Yeah, you can write it in the chat if you if you have a few seconds or. And I can in the meantime I can I can already so I'm gonna share my screen again for the window. There we are. So thanks again, Yuan, and you'll, you'll get a, a question, I guess, in a few seconds from, from Stefan. And uh, then we'll we'll move to Albon's presentation. Albon will present us uh, his PhD work, uh, which is actually ongoing. Uh, I think it's uh, more than a, a year and a half for, for Albon on real-time deformation based on physics-aware artificial neural networks. And you'll see how they are actually using neural networks and providing them input data from uh, 
directly from from physics simulation uh, from the MIMI system. So that's that would be next presentation. And let me just check the chat here. Did you have time to? Yeah. Well, well, a little bit of time uh, to, for Stefan to, to complete his, uh, his writing. Uh, Albon, are you here? Just to, to check that. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Perfect. Or... Yeah. 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 That's nice. perfect. That's perfect. So Stefan was asking, yeah, uh, can you, uh, I guess you can read, read it, but for the audience, in case you don't have the chat, it is, is it possible to go to clinical application with sometimes a simplified model without going first to complex models that are better accepted by the scientific com community? So, so should, should I take time to respond? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an excellent question. And thanks, thank you, Stefan. So, yeah, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, of course. Uh, and, and you know that uh, I agree. I agree with you on, on that point, definitely. Uh, but I would say as soon as we, we are doing this discussion of validation, uh, and actually, I'm convinced that for for most cases, we can we can we can still rely on simplify model. It's again uh, the idea that it's important to develop those kind of quite complex model that will allow us to show that maybe some complexity can be avoided and we uh, uh, are not useful in that case. So that that the that the um, that my main point. But we can chat about it uh, later, Stefan, if you want. But I, I fully agree. Thanks a lot. So, so sorry, uh, sorry, for, Albon, I replied quite shortly, but yeah, I, I don't think there is a way for you to really see uh, see both your screen and uh, at least you have two screens, but if you yeah. have just one screen, I, I think it's not uh, okay. not only for that. Well, Can I let you start the presentation? I'll leave yeah. you the floor. Please go ahead. Thanks, uh, thanks, Albon. Uh, so first, thank you for attending the presentation. Uh, we'll discuss about the real-time deformations using physics-aware artificial neural networks. Um, so this is my PhD work uh, that is supervised by Stefan Cotin. So we first have a quick introduction and we will discuss the contributions and finally uh, see the, the results. So at first, um, the finite element method uh, is a well studied and well understood uh, method to simulate a complex physics phenomena. And uh, while, I, while it gives uh, precise results, um, it also has the, the drawbacks of having important com computational cost, uh, which uh, makes it quite challenging to reach a real-time simulation uh, when computing uh, the deformation of elastic structures. So recently, uh, deep learning approaches have shown promising results in, in uh, the physics uh, field. Uh, first, with uh, uh, liquid uh, simulation, um, and now with uh, deformable bodies uh, simulations. So, as always with deep learning, there there are two branches: the unsupervised learning, uh, which uh, actually implement the governing equation as the loss function or the cost function. Uh, this has the advantages advantages of not needing um, a simulation framework, so acquiring uh, real, uh, real data. But uh, it, also, it is also quite slow to converge. It can, it can take up to uh, multiple weeks to multiple months to, to reach uh, what we can say uh, a trained uh, neural network and as opposed as an, well, the other branch is the supervised learning uh, that is the branch we we will present here um, so we compare the for a given input the output of the neural network to the acquired data or the simulated data so um, our work here will be mainly using the data-driven learning process, but we'll try to incorporate the, uh, the physics-informed neural network ID of um, using the governing equation uh, within the loss function. So as a context, um, this is pretty much the, the problem. We want to give uh, the force applied on each degrees of freedom at, as the input of the neural network and the output uh, will be the nodal displacements of each node. 
So the neural network here is the, um, the simplest possible one with a fully connected uh, and four layer. So to just enough to make it uh, to the deep learning uh, approach. So, okay. Uh, most of the deep learning framework are using Python. Um, so this is uh, interesting because it's, uh, it's fast to, to script uh, basic ideas and also uh, a lot of computer science tools have been developed in Python. And uh, the most important part is that a lot of uh, software of a Python interface, such as Blender, Maya, Physics, or even Sofa. And that's what we will use to uh, mix uh, Sofa with the neural networks, um, with the framework uh, PyTorch, sorry. Uh, we will use the, um, well, the, the new developed plugin, which is called uh, Sofa Python 3, which uh, implement the Python controller that uh, allow, to, allow us to access uh, different variables of the simulation uh, via the, the multiple events that happen during a time step. So this can be seen as code injection in the simulation. And uh, so as I mentioned, there are a handful of events uh, used in so far, uh, which is nice already. And um, to have a better access and a deeper control over the simulation, uh, we uh, unfortunately need um, more events to, to happen, to be sent to the script. And to do so, we often implement a component uh, to add uh, simply the, this event. But this could be uh, easily changed uh, with, a, with a few components. Uh, So as an example, in the plugin that we are using, um, since we use multi-process, we, we have uh, a data consumer and data producer uh, architecture. The data consumer is everything that is not, uh, correspond to everything that is not a data producer. So it could be the, as you can see, the neural network architecture. I don't know, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, yes, nice. Yes. Uh, so it could be the, um, the network architecture, as uh, we can see here, with the fully connected configuration, with the loss, the optimizer, and uh, layer dimensions. Uh, it could be the data set configuration and anything that is not actually the producer, even the meta definition of a producer. As you can see, we have the FEM beam that is actually here the data producer. And um, if you have already dealt with um, Python 3 plugin, you will, oh, well, this will look uh, familiar to you uh, with um, a Sofa environment that is um, a class from the, the Sofa core controller. We define the, the scene in the create function and we interact with the simulation using the animate begin event and animate end event. So in this script, we generate a random force. And at the end of the time step, we send this force to the neural network so it can train uh, itself. We'll send the force and the ground truth, so the displacement computed by so far. And finally, once you have trained your neural networks, uh, so we basically have the exact same, uh, exact same scene, and we only interact with the apply prediction that get the prediction from the neural networks to the to the environment or the data producer. So the goal so far with this thesis was to learn complex hyper elasticity laws with uh, what we call accurate deformation with an, an average relative error of around two percent. Uh, we want to be also able to handle various external forces, minimize the size of the data set while producing physically correct solution and also being able to guarantee solution validity. And we want to do so in, uh, with also achieving real-time simulation, which we set to 60 plus FPS. Uh, in terms of contribution, so we first we will first see the model-based dataset generation that aim at reducing, greatly reducing the size of the dataset. 
then we will discuss about the physics aware loss function that bring uh, physical knowledge in the, the training process. And finally, we will guarantee the solution validity by using the Renard-Breed Newton algorithm. So basically, if you want to train a neural network, uh, if, if you want to naively train a neural network, you will need to um, have around 400 forces per node you, on, the, on the object you want to train, which can quickly lead to a multiple uh, hundreds of thousands of forces. And uh, well, that takes a lot of time to compute. So what we did was to actually use the mechanical properties of the object um, by using this uh, equation, uh, the equation one, uh, that is given by the iterative solver, uh, which solve for the hyper elasticity of the object. So by using the stiffness tangent matrix K and the residual of the uh, and the residual forces, we can uh, modify the equation uh, by noticing first that at rest, so during the first iteration, the internal forces are null since we are in the rest shape. And um, and we can also um, use the Egan decomposition of the matrix K to easily control uh, the external forces that we produce. So a single coefficient of Q uh, can produce uh, very complex uh, external forces. So this gives us uh, multiple quality of life improvement when dealing with uh, uh, with multiple objects. So first of all, the size and distribution of the data set is entirely controlled by the sampling of the vector Q. So if you if you use only the first three, for example, coefficient of Q, you will know the, the deformation mode that you uh, put in your data set. And you can easily control the information access of the neural network. Um, each force corresponds to a combination of the principal deformation. So this is um, like dissecting the, the physical properties of the object and, show, and displaying them to the network. So you, you learn quite uh, faster. Um, you also provide an automatic generation of forces since you will rely on the matrix K, which already uh, um, already um, implement the Dirichlet conditions and and all of the the things that could uh, lead to complicated the uh, force generation. Um, and finally, the generalization of the training is um, improved also by uh, once we compute uh, an external forces, we set some values to zero. And uh, yeah, so we apply a mask uh, on the mask on the forces and we improve the generalization. So in terms of quantity, we can see that for 680,000 simulation, uh, we can reach uh, simply, well, we can have simply 5,000 uh, simulation in total. So it's quite, uh, it's quite a diminution. And in terms of, uh, of time, it speaks uh, uh, more easily, we come from eight days to generate the data set to one hour and 20 minutes uh, on average. Um, okay, so that was for the data set, now for the physics aware loss function. Um, so the most known and used uh, loss function is the mean squared error, uh, which is well suited for its job, but uh, it also tends to not uh, how to say it? not well represent the mechanical properties of the of the objects. And to do so, we want to modify the this function uh, in order to well first we want to keep the geometric convention, so we don't want to to fall into the unsupervised learning. And uh, we also want to improve it with some physical knowledge. 
as you can see, the mean squared error must be able to represent uh, all of the different um, uh, constitutive laws, uh, which is well, which represent a lot of different configurations. So to do so, we uh, use the residual of the forces after the prediction that we divide by the external forces uh, applied on the oops, sorry applied on the object. Uh, this, in fact, is the well at least in our solver is the convergent uh, criterion. So if this reach a certain value, uh, we consider the simulation uh, as, uh, as converged. And we introduce this, uh, this value in the load to modulate the, the impact of the MSC. For example, uh, when dealing with incompressibility, the MSC will not um, uh, differentiate uh, to disposition uh, well, to deformation, uh, one that compressed the object and the other that uh, that simply shifted the object in one direction, uh, which is well, which can introduce uh, a lot of physical error, and uh, we correct this by multiplying by this uh, coefficient uh, RU over uh, external forces. Uh, finally, done. so this was it for the physical awareness in the training. Uh, finally, the, in order to, uh, I forgot the name. Well, in order to, to validate the prediction of the network and to certify uh, the, the convergence of, uh, of the solution, uh, we modified the hybrid, uh, the Newton Raphson algorithm, which is the algorithm present in blue. And uh, we enhance it with the prediction of the network. So we first get the prediction and uh, we compare it to the first iteration of the Newton. If this first iteration of the Newton uh, leads to um, a, a bigger uh, residual forces, we then use the prediction uh, since uh, we have a better candidate uh, for the convergence. And this usually leads to faster and uh, well to faster convergence, as we can uh, see uh, later. So we'll now discuss about the result. Uh, do I have a, a lot of time? You have like minutes? yeah, five minutes left. Uh, if it's five, That's, is that for you? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So uh, the results are computed on two meshes. Uh, one is a propeller that is one by one by alpha meter. Uh, using a new can hyper hyperelasticity law with a young modulus of 203 gigapascal. And the other one is a beam, which is 100 meter by 25 by 25 with a saint venant kirchhoff hyperelasticity law and a young modulus of 4,500 uh, pascal. So, so in terms of results, um, both on the beam and the propeller, we we reach the, the the required criterion on the uh, mean average error. So we are around two two percent. Uh, the max error on the simulation can reach up to seven point one percent for the propeller, which is what well, quite important. But uh, yeah, for small displacement, uh, any noise. Uh, can produce a, a big error. And we have the signal to noise ratio. That is also quite promising since, uh, for example, for the beam, uh, the signal to noise ratio uh, show that we have uh, 48 times more uh, signal than uh, noise in the signal and 70, 70 times more signal than noise, uh, noise in the, the signal of the propeller. Um, so the prediction of the deformation of the uh, of the meshes that are twelve thousand degrees of freedom uh, that are composed of twelve thousand degrees of freedom is done in 0 0.4 milliseconds. So it's uh, two thousand five hundred uh, yeah two thousand five hundred uh, frame per second, which is 
uh, quite nice uh, considering uh, the real-time simulation. And finally, if we compare it to the MSC, uh, so the a beam train with uh, the classic uh, uh, loss function, we can see that the, the min error is uh, well 30% bigger than the max error. And uh, the max error is almost always as much as the the max error of the, the same beam, uh, which only vary by the, the, the loss function during the training. So all of the parameters to compare those two have been set to minimize the the beam error. So we can see that it's uh, even if we only consider the loss function, we have a great improvement uh, in terms of quality of the of prediction. And finally, to discuss about the Newton Raphson. Um, well, it's an artifact of the Newton Raphson that when we apply um, a force that is too strong for the, the solver, it, it tends to diverge. And um, over the 100 simulation that we applied, it did so, it did converge 68% of the time, where the hybrid Newton Raphson with the, um, the prediction uh, as a starting point converged 99% of the time. Um, and so the prediction also has been picked as 53% of the time, which show that um, even when the classic would converge, uh, it can also pick the, the prediction of the neural networks to, to do so, um, which is uh, quite encouraging in the physical uh, well, physicalness of the prediction, if I can say so. And uh, finally, um, in order to always converge, um, people uh, people uh, use incremental load applied on on their object. And if we do use incremental load, um, the classic Newton Raphson usually converge in 9.1 iteration and uh, tend to converge uh, somewhere between 3 and 15 iteration, where the hybrid Newton Raphson uh, usually converge in five iteration and uh, uh, well, usually converge somewhere between three and uh, let's say seven iteration. So it's a good improvement. And uh, yep. and that's it for, for me today. Thank you for attending the, the presentation. Thanks a lot uh, more for, the, for the presentation. Glad to, to discover uh, the results and, uh, and all, all the work you, you did those, uh, those last months. Uh, is there any question here in the chat? So there is actually several. First, uh, it was a question of Piriv asking uh, that it was not clear for him how the hourglass modes were actually detected and corrected uh, in the slide number 50. And do not hesitate, obviously, to, to unmute uh, Piriv if you, if, you if you wanna make your question more accurate. No, that's it. Thank you all both for the talk. And yeah, I was just not clear because it seems it would give the same force. So I couldn't. It's not clear from equation five how you distinguish between uh, yeah between the two and corrected it. If you could just yeah improve your your response. Uh, uh, I must admit that I don't understand what is uh, in our glass mode. So from what I understand is that. Um, um, you have the good prediction. Uh, maybe I got it right, but basically you also have some deformation shapes, which give you the same amount of residual force, but different shapes. And this is why I call it hourglass, but maybe I got you wrong. The the, the, the picture, uh, you mean about the figure nine on the, on the left yes. side? Yeah, this is just an example that, um, that, that shows, uh, well, this is a poorly drawn example, actually. Uh, I have a better picture somewhere. Uh, maybe I can find it. Um, so this is just an example that shows that, uh, for example, uh, on the right side of the, of the figure, the MEC is um, well is is uh, is less important than on the left side. Yet uh, we can see that if this was an incompressible uh, uh, square, uh, well, there we we do not. Uh, this do not uh, guarantee volume, volume conservation, where this is just a, a shift that we can easily correct if, if we need to. So it was just this, but this is a, a bad example. Uh, uh, 
uh, opposite. So the problem with the MSC is that there is no preferred direction uh, in terms of uh, convergence. And this is not interesting because um, so, well, in physics, yeah, so all those right. volumes is not the same as sharing or anything. And we want to um, add this factor of uh, how wrong a, a good prediction can be uh, using the residual NDA that we have here. That is solely based on the mecha mechanical properties of uh, the object. OK, so OK. OK, thank you, Albert. And the second question, uh, you can see that in the chat, uh, Alban, from Yacoub, uh, that was, I was wondering about the slide 15, the loss function of a form er error uh, times the residual can be dominated, uh, zeroed, by the R term, allowing for, the, for a quite large rigid body motion. Is there any reason why not to use a form uh, error plus alpha uh, times okay. the residual? Okay, so uh, yeah. the idea that well, the, I mean, it's not the idea, it's the, the reason that uh, we do not use the plus uh, RU uh, uh, factor is uh, that this uh, residual is computed from so far and thus cannot be differentiated using uh, the PyTorch framework. So um, when we compute the gradient of uh, the mean square error plus a residual, the residual, well, the residual part will become null, so it will not be propagated uh, through the network, thus not giving much information beside uh, well, growing the, the loss function that is displayed in the console. And mm. uh, yeah, so we multiply it by uh, the residual in order to keep this factor uh, during the back propagation and uh, can be dominated. But uh, may I comment? Yeah. So, but uh, it is, I mean, it is a all part of the loss function. I mean, this plus thing. So the uh, MSE error, which I called error here in the, in the, in the my yep. comment. And then instead of multiplying by R of U, uh, which is somehow scaled, yep. you could uh, just add the R of U and then you can uh, achieve something that uh, is uh, related to the fact that it will not uh, be dominated by the, uh, the uh, zero wing uh, residual. In, in your case, when you have a rigid body motion, probably your R of U will be zero, just zero. And, and then, then your loss function value will be zero as well. And so if you if make a, a, like a not multiplicative, uh, like if you don't multiply these two values, but you add them, then you can have uh, some weighted sum of both uh, uh, effects included in your loss functions. And perhaps this could allow you to find some sweet spot. Uh, yeah, but when I will differentiate um, the residual, uh, well, the, the final values by the, by the internal, for well, by the external forces given as input, uh, the residual, well, as it is in the, the framework, actually, is not computed from the, ah, the tensor, see. and ah, so it breaks the, the chain rule. And that's why I multiply it. Even though, yeah, obviously, well, we work on attached uh, objects. So, for example, the beam mm -hmm. that is somewhere here is attached on the left side, and the I propeller see. is also attached on, in the middle mm -hmm. to avoid uh, such uh, problems. Mm -hmm. OK, but, I, uh, I see the point why, why it is not done. So, OK, <laughs> thank you for your a very clear answer. With pleasure. Is there any other question? I'll check the chat, but I don't think there was additional point here. Uh, I would have other other questions that I'll ask you uh, in the corridor later on, <laughs> later on, Admiral. Yes. Um, thanks again. Yeah, do not hesitate if there is any, we can take one, one last question. If there is one, do not hesitate to unmute yourself and ask uh, directly the question to Alban. If if there is known, I mean, again, just unmute and, and interrupt, uh, interrupt me anytime, but if there is known otherwise, we would uh, take a break. The, the break was scheduled between 3.10 and uh, 3.30 uh, today, so CET, so in basically 10 minutes, we can just take those 
10 minutes of a break, like saying to restart in exactly 10 minutes, like 35, at, at 3.35. Um, thanks a lot for attending the, the, the workshop and let's see in a, in a few seconds each other. So I'm going to just share the screen for seeing the rest of the agenda of today. Perfect. There you are. Hopla. There you are. So for today, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, then pierre that will restart, uh, restart the session, uh, talking more about uh, tissue, tissue characterization and, uh, and FEM right, uh, right after the break. Okay. So just let's take 10 minutes break and restart uh, and, and let's restart at uh, 3.35. See you in a few seconds. Four. Yeah. Take the time of a coffee. And if you have questions, you can, I'll stay here. So do not hesitate to use the, the chat for, for more questions.
All right. Um, maybe we can start preparing the the screen, Pierre, since you'll be the the next one uh, at uh, three thirty-five. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Uh, you should be able, I think, to directly share your your screen. You actually yeah, should have this uh, this button down here. If you don't, uh, just here, make it up and make it uh, obvious for for the for the platform. You should have the sharing button appearing sure. down down the, the interface. Can you see the screen? Sharing seems to start, and I'll let you know when I see when I see it. Mm, it'd be like one. It's going to be started. Mm -hmm. Can do it again, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Again, for the for the audience, really do not hesitate uh, as uh, as Jakub and, and Pierre just did before, dropping the questions in the chat, or even better, if you if you just want to unmute yourself and take uh, take the mic for asking questions to the speakers, it's, it makes things even more interactive. So do not hesitate to 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 come uh, come on the floor and, and and take the mic. All right. So I I see ours. The, the the sharing is starting, but I don't see the I don't see the, the slides for the moment. I'm gonna ask. Others, I don't know, Fred, if you can see if you can see the screen sharing on your end. Ah, yeah, and now it works. Okay. okay. Can, can you just change the first slide so that we see? Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I just wanted to check for you know uh, how, how how fast it was, but yeah, that's perfect. Sorry for okay, yeah. for sorry for spoiling the first slides. No. <laughs> that's fine. Right. In my case, we go. Uh, I cannot see the period screen, so I don't know if uh, okay. Any, uh, any any other? I think it it will depend on. I mean, yeah, on the connection of everyone. It's it's. Uh, there was also some some. I can I can see. Yeah. You can see. If I, okay, fine. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I can see. It might depends on people connection sometimes, and and but it, it should come up to a point. Uh, it's just question of loading, I guess. Then when, once it's okay. uh, it's available, then the, the stream seems to be stable. Let me let us know if you uh, let's wait still like 30, 30 seconds for the, the next uh, the, the last people to arrive, and then uh, let us know if you if you cannot see it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I know I, I I was before on Firefox. It's it, I just moved uh, on on Chrome. It's slightly more stable mm -hmm. and sound is a bit better. So do not hesitate to okay. test that. So here you use you might have shared the whole, sc the whole screen up here. So we see. I think we uh, I've got your yours. Okay. So I can stay here, but I'm opening Google Chrome just in case. Ah, okay, okay, okay. That's why. Okay. Because for the moment we, I'm I'm seeing myself and and the and the WebEx interface uh, right. since you're sharing your screen. Right. Well, I open the Chrome just in case and. Uh... So you want, can you still not see my screen? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, I do, uh, but for you, you are, I'm sorry. Right, so participants. Okay, uh, um, I don't know where is it. Yeah, Jan, you are still here. Uh, can you can you see Pierre's presentation now? Is that? Okay, yeah, yeah uh, I moved to I moved to Chrome and now. Oh, okay, I'm... perfect. Okay, great. So I think we'll we'll be able to to restart. Uh, just a short introduction for this uh, this afternoon. So for the rest of the of the afternoon, we're going to have three other presentations. The first one being conducted by Pierre Yves, uh, which is already on stage. Uh, Pierre Yves, who is working at both Ensam and also uh, 
the Biomechanical Institute uh, in Paris. Uh, we met actually uh, more than a year ago, uh, first virtually because it was COVID, um, because yeah, there is very close topic be between uh, what uh, what Pierre is working on and what we are doing around so far. So Pierre is going to talk about the fin finite element modeling, which is a topic of high interest for us all, I think, tissue characterization and inverse methods, not on monkey tongues, but this time on the skin. And, I'll, uh, and the floor is yours, uh, Pierre, go ahead. Thank, thank you very much, Dean. It's been quite a time since we met, and yeah, um, so yeah, I will come back to you because I have a lot of things to share. It's very interesting. I'm very happy to 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 have the chance to give this talk because it's a very interesting community, and I think we 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 share a lot in common. And um, so for this presentation, I just wanted to give you a short overview of the approach we are trying to develop and to defend. Uh, one, to better understand the mechanism responsible for the loss of skin integrity during a plunge contact with an external device. And two, to prevent the appearance of skin damage. And um, so regarding Stefan's presentation, it's going to be more on the left, the hypothesis-based modeling. And regarding Johan's presentation, I'm going to talk about the biomechanical APAPA also, which is powerful. So, um, so the motivation is basically that there is a lack of understanding regarding the mechanisms that lead to the loss of skin integrity as a result of exposure to prolonged pressure or shear. So I have put a few examples on, on the left. And typically, the, where we started to work on it was basically we had a, a partner, an industry partner, who told us we are going to make some tests on a tetraplegic person. How long can we make tests on him? Is it five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour? one day before he starts to have skin damage. And so basically the challenge exists because it's called that the interface loads, the interface mechanical loads that are imposed on the patient are maintained within safe ranges that ensure the health of the, the, the soft tissues. And, um, and we know that there are many other factors other than the magnitude and duration of the load, which affect the, the individual's injury risk such as their age, their level of mobility, their nutritional status, the degree of perfusion, and many more. So, so that means that uh, the correct identification of the risk is challenging and prevents putting an, an effective prevention in place. So if we look at the literature, there are a lot of studies. And we know, because it has been consistently demonstrated, that um, uh, there are at least three mechanisms that are involved in the development of pressure ulcers. So we have uh, ischemia reperfusion injury, impaired lymphatic drainage, and sustained cell deformation. And um, so of particular interest at the mesoscale or tissue scale is the, um, the, um, the series of animal experiments uh, that have been performed in Eindhoven and which involve the indentation of the muscle of the brown Norway rats. And basically, they showed that where we had maximum shear strain inside the tissue, was where with histology, they identified uh, skin damage or soft tissue damage. And so at the human scale, um, we only have retrospective data in biophysical measurements. And so, which is um, basically, it's more difficult to get data at this scale. Okay. So, uh, are, you, are you still yeah. on the first slide or? Oh, I'm already on the third one. Uh, because ah. we, we don't see the screen, the, 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 the sorry, the, the slides actually moving. Uh, ah, are um, you, could you, could you try to, to restart? Yeah, sure. So maybe I'll, I'll stop the presentation and then I'll. And in the meantime, Alban uh, uh, uploaded a, a new, a new image to, be, to better improve, I think, uh, the, your question, uh, Pierre. So after your presentation, you could have a look to the link of uh, Alamo. Okay, I'll let you know when 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 we see the presentation. So I'll let you know for for me for me it's still loading. Guys, do not hesitate in the chat as well to say when it's uh, when it's properly loaded on your on your end. Okay, still loading for everyone apparently. Okay. I'm hesitating to move on to Google Chrome. I should have done it before. Mm. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah. I mean, you can you can take five, I mean, you can take one minute to, to, to do it. It should be it should be pretty quick if if you if you still have the link. Do you want me to, to copy paste it or? No, it's good. So okay, I'm perfect. The meeting. Okay, so I'm connecting on this one. Okay, great. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. I see your back gate, but there is uh, yeah, the sound is now okay set up. Mic seems to be activated. Perfect. Can you try to speak? Because I see the mic is activated, but I don't hear you for the moment. I still don't. Ah. Yeah. Uh, we'll let you know when, as as soon as we we actually can can hear you. If there is too much troubles here, maybe uh, I'll check. Uh, Olivier is in the area. Yeah, Olivier is here, just in case. But uh, oh, let's. Uh, Can you hear me, Hugo? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. And we see and we see your, your screen already. So I think if you go directly on the presentation, it should be it should be fine. Perfect. I hope it's so fine as well for finish. yeah for everyone. Uh, let us know again in the chat if there is a, any issue. Yeah, perfect. We see the slide number three here. Perfect. So uh, yeah, can I continue or? Yeah, could you restart from slide two just so that we we have the? And I'm sorry for. Yeah. So that we can we can see it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, sorry for for the technical delays. So what I was saying that the challenge is that we don't know what is the maximum interface mechanical load that you can put on the panel, and that maximum interface mechanical load is going to depend on region, on the patient, on the type of loading, on if he's sweating or not, on if he's uh, paraplegic or not. And basically, it's very difficult to, to evaluate and prevent risk. So if we look at all the um, laboratory and animal studies that have been performed in the literature, we know that there are three main mechanisms. So ischemia reperfusion, impaired defense drainage, and sustained cell deformation. And basically, it has been shown consistently, as you can see here, on many, many animal studies that Basically, where you have maximum shear strain is where you have uh, damage measured by uh, histology. So um, we know that it's a combination that all these mechanisms that contribute to the onset of the inflammatory cascade that ultimately lead to self death and necrosis of the tissue. And that in healthy individuals, basically, you have cellular damage, which is balanced by regenerative processes. And that um, basically, that in situation of extreme deformation and ischemia, the cell death would impede any remodeling process and lead to an accumulation of soft tissue that break down. So, um, yeah. So basically what has biomechanics to do with it? So this is where I wanted to come back to Yuan's uh, comment that, yeah, biomechanics of a papa is powerful. Um, so basically what has been shown in the literature is that it's the strain localization that is correlated to um, damage. And basically, this um, leads to two main questions. The first one is, can we evaluate this localization of shear strain in soft tissues, in humans, in clinically relevant situations? And the second one is, once you've identified this, uh, what is the mechanology behind? What is the link between the strain localization and the onset of soft tissue damage? So. In order to answer the first question, many people in the literature have done patient-specific fundamental element modeling, and all the issues that Yuan has outlined before are valid. So what is this undeformed configuration? What is the uh, personalized geometry, material properties, boundary condition? 
do we have sliding or not? So all these have been addressed in the literature. And we have also tried to do the same thing in our lab. So basically what we have done is we have two imaging modalities at the lab. We have um, bipanel X-ray imaging and um, basically algorithms that allow us to reconstruct in 3D from the 2D projections, um, uh, bony structures. And we also have uh, ultrasound imaging. So what we have done is that we have done two campaigns on 6.13 subjects. We have done some bipan X-ray imaging in the sitting position. We have done some optical scan and to have the external envelope and ultrasound imaging in order to have what happens inside in order to generate the personalized geometrical model. And then for the constitutive parameters, so that we assumed an first order of the law. And then what we did was we, for each patient, we asked them to sit on a custom-made uh, ultrasound chair that went into the uh, EOS cabin. So basically this chair was equipped with um, six component uh, force sensors. So we had six component of force and the three moments and also the ultrasound probe, which is given there. So with the um, X-ray imaging, we could have access to the 3D reconstruction of the pelvis. And because it was performed in the calibrated environment, we knew exactly where was the probe, where was the ultrasound image coordinate system, and where was the ultrasound image. And this is an example of what we were seeing. So while people were sitting and unloading, we could see the bone, the muscles, and the soft tissues, and we could track what was happening during the motion. So by combining this image and force, we did some inverse um, uh, modeling in order to identify the parameters of the constitutive law. And then we combine everything, we input the boundary conditions in order to simulate the strain localization. Initially, we wanted to compare that with digital image correlation of the ultrasound, but basically we made the ultrasound in two planes, in two perpendicular planes, and we saw that the out-of-plane motion was as important as the in-plane motion, which means that we couldn't have a Lagrangian description of the motion. So basically, the particle of matters were getting through the plane and getting out, so we knew we could not compare with that. And instead, we just evaluated the model on the interface, experimental interface pressure that we measured inside. So we did that first work, and Aurélien first of all told us that why do we have to make this very complicated model when all we are looking at is the strain localization underneath the bones? So what he did was he took the data that was available from the ultrasound in order to build a simplified model. And on 30 persons subjects, so healthy subjects, he showed that the strain localization predicted by the complex model was more or less the same thing as what could be obtained with a simplified model which was very encouraging because if you want to go to the clinical applications, then we don't need to make this whole gas factory. We could only just take the ultrasound measurement, make a model out of it in order to predict the strain localization. And then there were things that um, surprised us. Uh, in the literature, we did like everyone. We assumed that basically we have two types of tissues. We have the bones, we have the muscles, we have the fat, and that everything is tied together. And what we observed was that in certain people, actually, yeah, one third of the persons, the, the gluteus maximus and the hamstring muscle did not always remain underneath the ischium, but instead they stayed out of pain. So basically you had this rigid body motion of the muscle instead of uh, everything being compressed. Actually, it was mainly rigid body motion and a little bit of compression. So basically we overestimated the strain localization with the models and everybody does that because there, nobody validates this um, strain localization, even though it's the quantity of interest. And this has been reported by other people in the literature using MRI studies. So we know that there are a lot of things to be done in order to improve the kinematics of the tissue, basically, so as to make the model reliable and robust, and so that we can use the strain localization as a predictor of what's happening inside. And so basically this is work that is related to um, an ongoing uh, PhD student that um, uh, Yuan is supervising and that I have the chance to co-supervise with him. And basically the idea is to make some MRI of the buttock in the unloaded, unloaded configuration, perform some digital volume correlation in order to have access to an estimation of the displacement field 
in order to clarify this idea of what is the kinematics of the surface tools when you're being loaded. And so this was the first question. So can we evaluate the localization of the stress strains? Many people have tried. One of the problems is that it's not validated. And we see that there are very strong assumptions that are made, typically the fact that it's tied, which is not the case, and that this leads to um, challenges that need to be addressed. And and it's not the only one. Another challenge is um, the fact that most people in the literature use quasi-static description of what's happening, when in fact it has been consistently shown also with animal studies that um, you can have access. So basically, when you load the tissue, if you load it for a certain time, you can have damage, which can be quantified with histology. But if you remove it after a little time, this damage is reversible. Whereas if you go beyond a certain time threshold, this damage becomes irreversible. And this is something that is not taken into account in the literature, the, the dose of mechanical loading, basically. The dose of loading intensity times time, which is important and which is not correctly being taken, and which has an impact on how you model the constitutive laws and typically the, the time dependence of the stress strain response. And the second one is um, basically that um, um, all the, there are a lot of data in the literature that suggest that um, there is a cellular origin to pressure also initiation, so this wound initiation, and that it has, so basically that, um, um, basically it's important to take into account how does the mechanical load is transferred from the macro scale, the patient scale, to the tissue scale, to the microcirculation scale, to the environment of the cell cells, and to the cell itself. Because we know that this mechanical load is going to interact with biological phenomena and biochemical phenomena, and that this is going to affect how much the cell can sustain before they start to go to apoptosis. So typically, there is a strong interaction between mechanical loading and the biochemistry of oxygen. And also, basically, when the cells sense too much loading, they're going to express inflammatory cytokines, which is going to basically trigger biological cascades. And this is something which is going to affect the results, so which is currently not, not even understood, basically, and which requires to be further investigated. And so in the literature, people have um, uh, so there have been people who have tried to understand and model this soft tissue damage at the cell scale. So how did they bridge the scale? So most of them use um, computational homogenization schemes, so uh, finite element to the square. So typically um, in this team, uh, in Eidhoven again, they have some experimental data on the relationship between uh, deformation of cells and the percentage of dead cells. So basically they put some cells on um, some um, uh, um, yeah, some substrate, and then they pull, they deform the substrate, and they see that basically when you don't deform, you have virtually no cells that are dying. And the more you deform it, the more the amount of cells die. So what they do is at each curve points, they can compute stress strain, and depending on the amount of strain, they know how much cell death this should correspond. And this basically gives some um, interesting information on the role of microstructural features in various damage mechanisms. So other people have tried to relate other factors such as ischemia by using representative volume elements and doing homogenization in order to um, investigate the link typically between mas vasculature and the um, oxygen diffusion and um, the relationship with the macro scale um, uh, stress strain uh, of the tissue. And because this X square approach is very complex, there are people who are trying to do proleticity as an alternative approach to integrate multi scale and multi physics data in order to probe the relevant permanence at smaller scale and embed them at a, a larger scale. So this is typically what has been done by, by Giuseppe in the data before. And Basically, this is very interesting, and this comes at the price because, um, of course, um, doing this multi-scale approach introduces a lot of amount of unknowns, 
And this means that they are limited in their clinical application because they require input data that are challenging to obtain with sufficient uh, spatial resolution in even at a single time point. So um, notwithstanding these difficulties, so we have started working also on that. So very briefly, so uh, Thomas was doing his master last year with us. So I'm hearing his name a lot. So he's might be doing a PhD with us, but maybe he stayed in Luxembourg <laughs> because <laughs> You're trying to keep him. So Thomas has worked on yeah the modeling of the temporal evolution of the stress strain relationship of soft tissues using experimental data that was previously collected. So basically, it was um, from Dr. University who performed this um, um, confined and um, unconfined um, compression on muscle tissue. And so he had 31 samples that he sent to us. One half of them was loaded at the that is slow strain rate and the other one at the fast rate. So what Thomas did was he assumed that these samples were um, biphasic in nature, and he set up a porastic model in Abacus, and he tried to reproduce the experiment. And so basically, on the average stress strain curve, it was very comparable to what was previously reported with much more complex material laws. And on the one-to-one -one calibration, it was very interesting. So basically, this was the first step. And um, basically, how can we relate that with the underlying biological um, interactions with biochemistry and biological phenomena? So I just wanted very briefly to give you some results of another student I have the chance of collaborating with, with Stefan and, and Giuseppe on um, so how did he do this by coupling with biochemistry? So he was working on the tumor growth modeling, and he had a porosity model that was um, previously developed by Giuseppe and that he improved. And he wanted to reproduce the experimental results obtained by Alessandri, where basically he put some um, tumor cells inside a um, agina spherical capsule, and then the cells would grow. And as they would grow, basically in the middle, they would be deprived of oxygen and nutrients and they would die, whereas on the boundary, they would um, be able to grow. And uh, so basically the coupling was done by writing the mass balance of the different phases. So the solid phase, the liquid phase, including the um, living tumor cells and the necrotic tumor cells, but also by writing the um, mass balance conservation of the different species that would interact with the continuum. So typically oxygen, and inflammatory cytokines. And what was interesting is by comping these different scales and different phenomena, he was capable of predicting the um, evolution of the stress concentration of the oxygen concentration and the density of the necrotic cells. So as I was saying, um, he, um, doing multi-scale modeling is very interesting because it allows to probe the phenomena that happen at a low scale. But if they are to be of clinical value, it's not sufficient because these models must make predictions that are based on clinical data that can be measured in vivo. So I had just, yeah, one slide to say that um, um, there is maybe opportunities with machine learning there because basically multi-scale modeling aims at identifying causality and establishing causal relationships. And this comes at a price. And where machine learning basically allows to um, identify correlations and infodynamics from a large set of data. And then there is this very interesting paper by um, students of Ellen Kuhl who basically, I like that they presented it. So they say that where machine learning reveals correlation, multi-scale modeling can prove whether the correlation is causal. And on the inverse, where we identify mechanisms with multi-scale modeling, machine learning coupled with Bayesian methods can quantify uncertainty. So I think there is some approach there that we could use in order to overcome some of the challenges that appear when we do all these complex modeling. So to conclude, basically, um, yes. So initially, it's important to quantify the stress strains at the tissue level. And the question is, how do we make the bridge with the impact on tissue variability? So we know that all these phenomena that happen at um, cell scale behavior are important. And the more we try to model them, the more it becomes computationally expensive and machine learning can help to overcome these difficulties. And maybe I can um, stop there by 
um, asking the question that Stefan asked previously. So we are at a point where we are saying, should we now consider simplifying the model and deriving low fidelity digital models? Or should we continue with developing this complexity and basically all the things that we lose by deriving a low fidelity digital model, we can infer this process inside by using machine learning algorithms, for example, so as to be able to go to clinical routines. Um, yeah, I think I want to say that this approach basically would like to use it on other applications of the larger foot, and typically for the um, design of prosthetic rockets. And, and yes, I think I was a bit long, and that's all. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to help to answer. Thanks a lot, Pierre. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Is there any question in the audience uh, regarding uh, Pierre's presentation? So for the for the moment, there was there was none in the chat. But do not hesitate, as I said, to unmute yourself if you if, if you have some. Yeah, maybe I can, I can start. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. But it's a very nice uh, presentation, and we see the complexity of the required modeling here. It's it's impressive. Uh, maybe general question close to your conclusion. Uh, so if you would uh, imagine some um, some experimental data we could collect on, on, on humans uh, uh, in relation to, to this question, what kind of uh, experiment would be would you Im imagine yeah, for that? Yeah, so um, so typically if so the, the approach we're proposing here would be porosticity. And for the porosticity, basically, by using the model that Thomas proposed, there is one, the solid scaffold, like a sponge, and two, the pure fusion. And we were thinking of using ultrasound in order to have idea of the, um, um, the stiffness of the soft tissue scaffold. And for the pure fusion, I was thinking of if there is a way of using, again, imaging, such as, for example, Doppler imaging, so this one is the one we can get with our echographic system. So it's the perfusion which is due to the blood, but also we can use more recent technologies such as the LCOT, LCOCT, which we was developed by a French company. The only problem is that it's, of course, very high resolution of the order of the micrometer, but the penetration is very low. So it, <laughs> we are measuring things at the skin. But basically, I think that there are some technologies that could be used in order to feed and initialize these models. And also, I think that all the things that Béranger is doing in terms of um, uh, oxygen concentration, tension, and uh, eventually the microvasculature, I think there are some technologies there that could be used to initialize models. And, and again, um, the idea could also be to make with what we have and complete what we are missing with, by, for example, so that we could use data that are used on other things that are big for themselves, but try to use a distribution in order to improve the approximation. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot. Is there any other question? We would we could take an, a second one, and then we'll, we'll, move to, we'll, we'll move to Olivier. Is there any other question here? I see. I see that uh, Adrien and Stefan are uh, activating the camera. So, uh, in case you have questions, guys, do not hesitate. But uh, any any other question? I'm just checking in the chat. Uh, nothing new here. Okay. Maybe and, if yeah. I, if I can ask a short other question, yeah, uh, uh, Pierre, you you presented uh, as the the use of this uh, EOS um, uh, image uh, device. Uh, um, do you mm -hmm. think uh, if we can imagine a clinical routine in the next ten years, do you think such kind of imaging modalities could be used uh, in in the clinical routine of the design of of new kinds of biomechanical model? Is it uh, can we imagine such a use, or is it like uh, CT or MRI data much more difficult uh, to, to collect for a kind of routing use? So the the, the <laughs> tricky question you had. So the, the, the honest answer is I don't know, because as you mentioned, so it depends on we need to demonstrate what we need to show, I mean, which is correlated to the risk. And I'm and I'm thinking that maybe in 10 years, maybe biomechanics won't be that important because maybe we just measure geometry and stiffness and put that in the back box and here is keep an index which is related to the risk. And maybe that's the 
but may, maybe that can be guided in that. So this is how I expect things to go, but maybe that won't be the case. And if we see that personalization in terms of biomechanics is still important, then that means that we will have demonstrated that it's important, that, there, that there means that there's a benefit for the patient. And in that case, yeah, we could evaluate him and use, for example, um, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just saw your comment, Nico. It's I'm not being pessimistic, but I'm just saying that, yeah, um, as long as we don't know what is the clinical value of what we are doing, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just a, just a joke. <laughs> Any very last question? Or should we do not hesitate again to, to unmute? Uh, Yuan, if you have a, a, a third question, do not hesitate. <laughs> oh, no. uh, and fine, anyone but... else, of course, uh, do not hesitate as well to unmute. All right. Um, we can maybe then move to the second, after the break, uh, second presentation uh, of uh, this uh, second part, which is Olivier's presentation. So it's my pleasure. We'll, we'll move to uh, biomechanics. And even sometimes here, it was very close to rheology, biology sometimes, uh, to soft robotics. So we, uh, we can hear you now, Olivier. It's perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah perfectly fine. And uh, yeah. Sound is, uh, sound is good, uh, and you should be able to share your screen. You are actually uh, even already got the you already got the, the stage, so you can uh, okay. be able to, to to share your screen. So it's my pleasure to welcome Olivier, which is a, a Inria researcher at uh, Inria Lille in the north of France, working on soft robots, and you will tell us more about the modeling, the control, and application uh, of soft robots. Thanks a lot, Olivier. Uh, yeah. Can you see the slides? For the moment, you are. We, we see. We see the the interf I mean, the we see the slides, but as an editor view, maybe. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. It's uh, it's slow. It's it's, it's trying to. It's trying to load the slides through screen. Okay. For some reason, it's uh, struggling. Uh, while it's uh, loading, so yeah, uh, Christian Durier, uh, who's the the director of the defrost team was supposed to do his presentation so uh, but he was not available uh, this afternoon so i uh, i got the, the chance to uh, to do it uh, instead of him and uh, so i got his uh, his slides but uh, can you still hear me yeah yeah, yeah definitely okay. uh, we, can, we can hear you fine just uh, we, we still see the the same uh, yeah yeah so, i don't get why for some reason I cannot put it in full screen. Can you try maybe a short, uh, short F5 or? Yeah, but uh, it's. I think it's because I'm presenter that uh, that it because uh, <laughs> it was working uh, 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 two minutes ago. But uh, okay. Do you, do you wanna? Okay, maybe I just uh, try to stop and restart. Yeah. See if it does anything different. Uh, Ah, okay. Okay. Tick. Sorry for that. No problem. I think we should be working. Okay. So if I start again, and actually it's here. Okay. Can you see the the full screen? For the moment, I'm still on the on the slides, but maybe it's just a question of uh, of loading again. I'll tell you. Again, same I'm going to ask. Uh, yeah, same for you, fine. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, I'll try one last thing. And, uh, <laughs> let's see, maybe I should start uh, to share my screen instead of uh, just the application. Let's see, up, share. Okay. And yeah. There. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's perfect. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I was just saying. So I apologize uh, uh, for the slides because uh, so I took uh, Christian's slides, but uh, we have a transfer from uh, Mac to uh, <laughs> Linux. So, but most it's mostly working, but there is some weird uh, formatting. Anyway, so yeah, I will talk about uh, modeling control and applications of such robots, and uh, so I will present some. Uh, examples we have in the team. 
and I will focus a little bit on the second part on uh, recent work we did on anisotropic uh, soft robots. So let's start. So soft robots. So why soft robots? So uh, like you did the uh, biomechanics a la papa. So we are not doing robotics a la papa. We are doing uh, young robotics because uh, uh, soft robotics is uh, quite uh, in the field of robotics is quite uh, uh, new, let's say. So so the idea is that robots are not uh, we're not considering stiff robots anymore, but we are considering soft materials to build the robots. Typically, uh, it's bio inspired. So like in the in the bottom right corner, you have an example of a kind of uh, worm-like uh, soft robot that is uh, rolling around. Um, and it's based a lot on uh, 3D printing, actually, because it's, it allows either to print a mold in which we can cast silicone. Often, uh, soft robots are made of silicone. It's quite cheap and uh, easy to use. Or you can directly print, 3D print uh, soft material. So it's quite... Uh, quite used a lot in, uh, in the soft robotics community. Uh, okay, so that's just the quick intro, uh, if you're not aware of soft robots. Uh, and in soft robotics, compared to uh, traditional uh, robotics, so you have more, you have new challenges. Uh, typically, like uh, standard uh, rigid robots have few degrees of freedom, and the modeling is quite simple because you just have to modelize uh, uh, the angles at each of the joints. But typically, it's quite a few degrees of freedom. If you are in a soft robotics, you you have a continuum for your material, and you have a, potentially infinitely many degrees of freedom. And uh, so you have to deal with all of this, including in control. Also, it makes uh, control automatic control uh, algorithms quite intractable in the case of soft robotics because you have too many uh, too many unknowns. So there's a lot of uh, stuff to do in uh, research wise. So the team has quite some experience. So it may be agency. Yeah. We are an INRIA team in Lille, you know, called Defrost. And uh, so here I just show some a few examples with a, a trunk over here. So it's a soft trunk. So you have the video moving on the, the top right. So it's a silicon uh, made of silicon, and you have two sections with uh, attached with cables. And when you pull on the cables, you can create some bends on either the first or the second section. So we use uh, the FEM to modelize the deformation. And this, on the top right, is actually an open loop uh, control of the, the trunk. So uh, you have the simulation on the, the left side. And uh, what is uh, special here is that um, so it's, it's an inverse model, in the, which means that we are not uh, predicting the the deformation of the trunk according to a certain actuation on the cables. But it's more subtle than that, let's say. We are aiming at, uh, so the effector is the tip of that uh, trunk. And we uh, input that to the simulator. And the simulator is able to compute what actuation should be given to the cables to for the tip to reach uh, the position we desire. And that's what you see on the, what you saw moving <laughs> there was the uh, the simulation computing that and inputting that result to the real robot that is uh, following quite well, actually. But that's an open loop, which means there is no uh, feedback from what happens in the real robot to the simulation. Obviously, there, are, uh, there is discrepancy between the ideal uh, FEM model and the, the real robot. And so that's, I think that's where it started not to work. Yeah. So uh, on the video uh, bottom right, there, there should be a video. Uh, so you just see the, the picture, I think, there. Yeah. Indeed. yeah. <laughs> so trust me. But uh, so uh, for the, the right part, uh, we have a, a sensor, so a magnetic sensor that gives us in real time the position of uh, the tip and the middle part of the robot. And uh, we have control strategy that allow to correct the model and to follow very well the, to, to correct the behavior of the simulation. Uh, okay, uh, I will try something risky. I will show because I will show you now that what we did, the inverse model, can also work with contact. So let's see. You still see my screen, I hope. And I will show this. Let's see. No, not this one. <laughs> 
take this one. Okay. So hopefully you see a video. Yes. Yes. Okay. So same thing you have uh, left and right, the simulation on the left and the real robot on the right. So no, everything was working fine, but now we, uh, in the real world, we input, uh, there is an obstacle that is not taken care of in the, in the simulation. So obviously then we are not reaching the target as, uh, as expected because the, the simulation doesn't have the knowledge of the, the obstacle neither its uh, position. So nothing is surprising here, it's not working. And now if we track the position of the, of the obstacle in the simulation, the inverse model takes the contact into account and is able to find uh, an actuation that allows to reach the goal, uh, even considering the, the obstacle. So the, these are uh, results, uh, some results of, uh, of the team. Uh, wait. Okay, let me go back. Uh, okay. So that was it. Uh, okay, so now I, I will move on to, so these were um, isotropic uh, soft robots. And recently we looked at uh, more, uh, a bit more complex materials, so anisotropic mesostructures. So uh, one definition for metamaterials, that is the one we consider, it's uh, so a material that has a specific macro-structured tile uh, and that gives it a specific uh, mechanical properties and uh, that can be easily more or less 3D printed. And also, so with that, you can uh, a bit program the material you're going to use, which is quite uh, powerful, actually. So you can create some anisotropy in it, uh, and you can create some uh, unusual uh, behavior. So uh, what we are using, in, um, what we'll be, we'll be using is um, a slicer from uh, another Unreal team in Nancy. So you show, it's the team of Sylvain Lefebvre in, in Nancy. So on the, the picture on the bottom right, actually they, are, they have designed a, a foam that can be 3D printed and that you, uh, you can input a, a certain density of the material, a certain direction of anisotropy and, uh, and then the slicer will, uh, will slice that for you and it will create, you, then you can print it and you will get a material uh, following what you inputted. So, as an example here, we show this very simple robot that's a tripod robot. So we have this, uh, this uh, sheet with three uh, legs, let's say, but attached to three motors. And uh, so the, the original uh, robot is uh, shown on the left so with the red, uh, red silicone. So it's completely isotropic. And as you bend uh, the motors, you have a completely uh, symmetric uh, behavior. And then, so we, uh, thanks to this slicer, we created this, uh, this sheet that has a spiral-like uh, anisotropy. And as you, uh, so if you replace the original sheet with this, so they call it, uh, this is a closed cell foam. They call it a foam. Uh, if you replace the silicone by this foam, you get uh, a new movement so you get some sort of rotation at the, the top of the robot. So this is quite actually uh, powerful to do, to do some uh, interesting things. Uh, so first we, yeah, we looked at modeling this. So obviously modeling the foam is very complex because it has a very uh, uh, complex structure. So we have, uh, we modelize it as a continuum. We've uh, homogenized the model. Uh, and no, because uh, we are using just for silicon uh, linear elasticity. And no, because we are using an anisotropic model, we have more mechanical parameters. So typically, we have uh, two young moduli, and you have uh, a certain direction of anisotropy. So you have more uh, variables in your uh, uh, stiffness tensor. But uh, okay, so this is the. Uh, nothing really new the newton second law that we have in so far so uh, 
يبديني أشياء يقول تو سو ذا سم اوف اكسترنال فورسيز بلس انترنال فورسيز ان اف اند اتش تي لامدا ريبريزنت كونسترينت اون ذا موديل سو جيت كان بي كونتاكت كونسترينت اور اكتويشن كونسترينت اوكي يا سو ذا انترنال فورس ان ذات كيس وي يوز ا سيمبل ميش اوف تيتريدوال ايليمنتس So these are in, impacting the internal force and the, the mass as well. And uh, in HT lambda, yeah, you have the, the constraint of what the actuators are applying on the soft uh, sheet. Uh, okay, and so in that case, H represents the direction of the... So it's, it keeps moving as the, the servo motor turns. The direction of the of the uh, actuation, and lambda represents the force imposed uh, on the soft sheet. So these are in, uh, input as constraints, and well, I skip uh, lots of steps, but essentially what we have at the bottom is an interesting relationship that helps us to solve the, for example, the inverse problem. So. Uh, It gives us basically lambda is the force on the, the torque on the servo motors. So that through the compliance matrix uh, uh, W here, it gives you basically how much force you apply on the motors and how much delta represents the motion of the effector, which is the very center of the soft sheet. So it tells you, it gives you a direct relationship through the material properties that are in the compliance matrix between force on the actuator and the actuators and movement of the effector. So with that information, we can solve the, the inverse problem. And here is an example where, okay, it's a bit uh, shaky, but I hope you can see. Um, okay, so it's smooth, so. It's, uh, yeah. for, in, in my, uh, on my screen, it's jumping a little bit, but. Uh, so what is shown in this video, actually, if I go back and forth, So we, there we input not the position of the uh, effector as a goal, but we input its, uh, its orientation only. So basically, the, the blue uh, frame is a goal of uh, orientation that we want for our, uh, our effector. And uh, the movement of the motors is computed uh, according to this. So as you, as you rotate the blue uh, frame, the motors move to so that the orientation matches that. So this would be completely impossible using uh, isotropic material because the orientation would not change no matter the, uh, the actuation. So that's the, the funny, I think the funny thing of using anisotropy in this case is that we don't change the geometry of the robot, only the, uh, only the material uh, constitutive law in a way. And that is the, Uh, yeah, that is a simulation, a direct simulation in this case. Uh, comparison between uh, with the real robot and uh, the simulation. So we have a fairly good. Uh, at least we can we show we, we can reproduce the general behavior. Okay, and uh, let's see if I can move to the next slide. Okay. Okay, and now, so this is uh, what we can do with this that is quite a little bit more uh, in a practical application is that we can control a new degree of freedom if you put two of these uh, tripods uh, in opposite directions. So I think uh, there I will again uh, move to the video because otherwise I can't, I don't want you to watch the whole video, it's a bit too long. Uh, where was I? This one. Okay, you can see a video starting, yeah? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so uh, this was the original tripod robot. So completely isotropic. This is the new one we created with uh, this spiral-like anisotropy. And now, so what I talked about before, the, the inverse model, we can still do it here. So there you have uh, basically, uh, maybe I, I just uh, put it on hold. Uh, let me put it somewhere where it's more visible. Uh, okay, so there is a bit of dynamic effect, but uh, so in blue is uh, 
the blue frame, completely blue frame, is the, the goal. And we suppose we attach the two tripods with a, a rigid beam in between. And the middle of this beam is the new uh, effector that we want to we want to control its position. So uh, in this case, the inverse model is able to to match the blue uh, frame in real time. And the interesting thing is that so for now all of these movements were possible with the isotropic sheet, but that very movement right now I don't know if you can see <laughs> we are rotating uh, the six degree of freedom that is. Uh, that would not be possible in uh, with uh, an isotropic material. I don't know if you saw it. Basically, with the isotropic material, you can create, you can uh, control five degrees of freedom, the three translations and two rotations. But the rotation in the axis of the tripods is not controllable because you have no uh, no control of it because the material would be is isotropic, and because we are using an anisotropic. Uh, sheet. Now we are able to control that uh, that six degree of freedom, uh, and we are we can still control the five over ones. So here is a exploration of the workspace of the robot, which means all the position we can uh, uh, we can reach, and the color actually. So I stopped just a second. Uh, in blue, it means you can reach that position, and also you can rotate in all directions at that position. So as long as you stay in the center, you can uh, control everything. And if you move, move towards the border, uh, you have not so much uh, range of, uh, of motion. Uh, OK, wait a I, I skip a little bit. Well, this is just to show it in real time. So uh, the application of this in the very end yeah, so that that is the degree of freedom I'm talking about. The sixth degree of freedom is the is this one that would not be controllable at all with a an isotropic uh, silicon sheet. Okay, and the application is uh, amazing. So you, see, uh, you have a, a maze and you have a, a a ball, and we are able to uh, make that ball uh, go all the way around the maze. And in that case, we are really uh, using the that sixth degree of freedom we have. Uh, we are able to control. Okay. Yep. Let me close this. Okay, and I think I will be soon done. Uh, from current slide. Okay. Up. Let's see if I can move. Uh, okay, that's what I was saying. Yeah, that's what we did. Uh, okay, so yeah, it's, I, I'm reaching the conclusion. So in this case, so we we use uh, metamaterials to build a soft robot, and that gives us new, even just kinematics possibilities. So it means the new new motions, keeping the same geometry and the same position of the actuator. Obviously, the the behavior changes. Uh, yeah, and future work, actually, so this slides the date a little bit. So as future work, we had calibration. So we have done some work recently, uh, but it's just submitted, not published. But uh, we have an automatic calibration uh, strategy to 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 fit really well the uh, the the mechanical parameters to the, the real robot. Uh, OK. Ah, yeah, and just uh, Christian, I think, wanted to talk about this also. And also, let's not oppose, because I saw there were some uh, also AI-related uh, talks. So let's not oppose model-based approach and uh, artificial intelligence. So, uh, so model-based is useful, because we, we, are, we can well, very well modelize uh, the deformation. Uh, but the good thing is that it's easy to generate data that can be fed into uh, AI uh, algorithms. So it's uh, it's really uh, not uh, opposed, but uh, can work together, I think. OK, so thank you very much. You can uh, see us on uh, our website. So far, I guess you heard about so far and uh, the Twitter of Lee. 
Excellent, uh, uh, Olivier. I, I already gave the, the link in the, in the chat. Yeah, did, did you want to add something as well? Sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, no, no, I, I'm done. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for for the presentation. So you already got uh, got the website in the in the chat uh, in the chat a bit earlier. I could point you out the the, the YouTube uh, YouTube account also of the of the Defos. Um, is there any question? So there was a, a question, a oh, question first of uh, Pierre Yves about the. You mentioned the fairly good agreement uh, on on the uh, you know on the control of your soft robots. It was yeah regarding the verification and validation. You know if there is some errors regarding the the control of your of your robot. Yeah, so obviously there are errors because uh, just uh, the printing uh, process, what we uh, theoretically want to print and what we have in the end is uh, is not the same. <laughs> but uh, so in, in robotics, we have the good uh, thing that we can, uh, so even with a, a bad model, we can, well, in that application, we didn't show it, but we can have uh, sensors that allows to correct the, this the, the the errors of the model to match uh, reality and uh, yeah i mentioned it uh, briefly at the end but uh, so we looked recently at uh, how to calibrate uh, the fem model with the real data so basically we we have a send so, but that, that would be offline in that case so offline we generate some data not enough to make a, to learn uh, the model with ai but enough to uh, fit, let's say, the, the FEM model. And we have, uh, basically, we have a sensitivity analysis of how the model changes when you make a small variation of young modulus, for example, how it affects the results. And it allows to do optimization to fit yeah, the, uh, in a least square way, and let's say, the, the data as, um, uh, as good as possible. So yeah, but definitely, we always have uh, <laughs> differences between uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the the question behind the question i had was basically in many cases i'm thinking of what uh, they are doing in in luxembourg on the on the press mechanics is basically how can you load the same system in different loading conditions but in a controlled environment when you know the load in order to either feed the model to validate it or to get validation data this is something we struggle with and I've got the impression that we can um, divert your system in order to do these kind of difficult experiments yeah. that we can do on living subjects. Or... Yeah, I think uh, uh, maybe like for us it's easier because uh, it's robots and we it's not a human uh, organ. Or, so it's, I mean, even with robots, uh, you input something to the actuator a certain position and actually uh, sometimes it's not exactly what you have. But uh, I guess it's easier to have the exact boundary condition. Yeah. I just want to take over the, the, the time, but basically I'm thinking also about the truth cube, where people are struggling to have the ground reference data so that they can evaluate all the things. And your system could provide this kind of reference data set. I mean, yeah, just, yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, and, I mean, this, is why, and this is why basically, yeah, quantifying the, doing the verification and validation would give some ideas as to, how robust the data is and how reliable it is. And that was what I had in mind, yeah. Okay. But thank you, very, very good talk. Yeah, it's not my talk, it's Christian's talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gave it well. <laughs> so, and, and regarding, so soft robotics as, uh, as Olivier presented and, and even more generally medical robotics tomorrow. So there will be tomorrow morning a, a dedicated session about soft robotics. Uh, it's actually the first one uh, at nine o'clock uh, for uh, during the symposium and the first one in the afternoon about medical robotics and especially about medical robotics. Maybe it's something close to your point, uh, Pierre-Yves. There will be a presentation from uh, Stefan, which is a, a postdoc from uh, from the same Defrost team. Uh, on you know how soft robots can can somehow be used uh, for like uh, it's not re rheological tests here but it would be a fatigue tests and stuff like that it's uh, quite cool. Uh, is there any other questions? So yeah, you had another one, but it, it's a, a potential. You, you said Pierre that it was a potential application of your work would be to to probe biological systems complex complex loading. That's what you what you just said. Is there any other question in the in the audience? Uh, I noticed several stuff, but I, I know I know pretty maybe, well. Yeah, maybe one short, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe two short, two short question. Actually, I was very uh, impressed by uh, 
the, the possibility of, of your um, offered by, by your 3D, I mean the 3D printed uh, form phantoms. I wanted to know whether uh, with this kind of, of technology it's possible to print uh, very soft uh, materials. I mean, in similar stiffness as, as the one we observe in soft tissue, some, some, uh, some kilopascal, I would say, in terms of equivalent stiffness. First question. And second question, um, you, you showed us an uh, example with a material with a negative question threshold. So just wanted to know what would be the interest in terms of soft robotics to, to get such kind of, of material. OK, so for printing very soft uh, things, so uh, it's possible to print quite, I'm not uh, quite soft stuff. I'm not sure how uh, soft you want, but uh, uh, so you can play with the, uh, the density. So of course, if you go below, uh, there is a limit, but uh, if you go below, it will not be, uh, uh, it will break. But um, they are creating more and more um, soft uh, filament that we put in the 3D printer. So before you were only printing uh, quite rigid, plastic rigid, uh, uh, filament and now it's becoming more and more possible to print uh, soft, um, uh, softer, but uh, not completely soft, but uh, soft enough. And then if you put uh, this end with a uh, low density, you get something that is quite soft. Uh, I think maybe matching uh, some silicone. But I mean, we are not uh, here. We, it's not our. We are more users of this. Let's say. We are not experts in uh, fabrication. It's more the Nancy team uh, that is expert. Um, and the other question? Uh, yeah, to, to uh, the, concerning the, the the reason why it's interesting to work on. Ah, uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it's true. <laughs> the, uh, beyond the fact that it's fun. <laughs> no, I, um, there are some examples that uh, they use that property to in uh, some clever way to uh, to generate some motion for the locomotion of a soft robot in a in a, in a tube uh, i could not uh, <laughs> not able to describe the mechanism but it was based on this that that, that strange property that somehow you were uh, with the friction on the tube and the, the release and i i can't i can't describe it uh, but it can okay. for some clever people who think about uh, mechanisms this can be, uh, you can take advantage of that. <laughs> but, uh, Olivier, I'm going to drop two questions that I have in the chat after uh, for you, Olivier, but uh, we'll, we'll, we might, and others can actually uh, as well uh, complete uh, and add more questions in the, in the chat. But just for a question of time, uh, I suggest that we we pass to the to the next and last uh, presentation for today, that will, that will be presentation of, uh, of Yakub. Uh, from University of Luxembourg, on, uh, and he will explain us how to, uh, program a, a programmable matter can actually help in, uh, in mim mimicking uh, real life. So I'll let you the floor. You should be able to. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Mm. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see me because I cannot see myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, can, we can see you. Okay, and... this is great. Okay, uh, so I, I, I will share. Yeah, thank you. So I will share the screen number two. And Olivier, in the meantime, I'm going to write my questions. OK. Can you see my uh, screen now? Yes, and it's not full screen yet, but we see. OK, it's, it's, see it's not. Yeah, OK. Now it should be turned now into. It is, now it is. That's perfect. Yeah. OK. Thank you so much for your invitation. My name is Jakub Langevich. And, uh, I'm affiliated both in the University of Luxembourg and uh, in the Institute of Fundamental Technological Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Poland. And uh, about the topic, um, I'm, I'm, I'm collaborating uh, on the two topics that were uh, discussed today already uh, by Johan partially, and I collaborate with Arnaud and Thomas on, on uh, detecting elastic properties by, by a full image uh, analysis. And uh, the, the topic which was cover, covered by Alban uh, Odo, uh, which we work on with SORAP uh, on machine learning approaches. 
Uh, but with uh, Stefan Bordas, we thought that perhaps I will, I will uh, show you some new topic that uh, could be of possible interest for uh, data, data driven biomechanics or, or robotics communities and uh, give some perhaps inspirations and directions for, for future research. The topic is a bit about out of this world. Uh, and perhaps uh, uh, as long as Pierre Yves and his approach, which would make uh, biomechanics uh, people jobless. Uh, this technology can possibly make all of us jobless when AI, AI and robotics will gain control on, on everything. Uh, so uh, yes, let's 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 move on. So the the, the, the topic is artificial life of shape shifters, and I will try to put it in a more wider or suitable context just to gain more more understanding what I will be talking about later. Uh, so uh, the the life is. Uh, based on self-organization and, and self-organization is ubiquitous in life and you can observe it in a various various land scales and um, even for the large organis organisms like uh, in that case ants fire ants you can see that they can cooper cooperate and uh, can they are actually a good engineers and they can build some useful structures uh, by their own bodies uh, to to make their colonies survive so we could, they can build, build bridges or rafts or ropes or other structures that are of, of use for their uh, colony. But uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of behavior can be observed uh, for for smaller uh, organisms. In this case, I will show you some unicellular uh, microorganisms like uh, slime molds which normally they live uh, alone as a single cells and they, they, they just feed on some uh, fungus or, or some bacteria. but uh, if they, they have some more social cycles in life uh, in which they are building uh, bigger structures. They can move uh, as, as ensembles uh, and build some very nice, uh, as you can see, the mushroom-like structures. And this is all motivated uh, by the fact that their colony have better chances to survive when they are doing so. Uh, but, but this kind of uh, individual or, or collective uh, motion of, uh, of cells are not only reserved to this uh, single cell organisms, but it is uh, ubiquitous in all organisms, like in our, in, in our organisms. And this is in particular important uh, Mm, uh, when we think about uh, cell migrations and individual or, or collective, which is uh, vital to, to, to analyzing uh, tumor metastasis, for instance, the, the topics that, that, here, that is analyzed by Stefan Erkan, uh, for instance, uh, which, with whom we, we collaborate as well. Uh, and uh, when we go even more down in the in the in the landscape, we can see all this machinery that uh, propels uh, our ourselves, our life. Uh, these are all molecular, biomolecular complexes that uh, uh, makes the, the living uh, cells live. Um, so this is a sort of uh, uh, biological robots that propel ourselves. Uh, so the question is uh, whether it is at all can be achieved uh, in an artificial manner. And uh, uh, there are uh, two uh, leading approaches towards this kind of uh, artificial systems. And one of them is the bottom-up approach, uh, which cover, is covered by synthetic uh, chemistry of bi or biology, in which the people can, can try to uh, tweak the behavior of, of, uh, of these microscopic systems in order to gain some new functionalities. But of course, the, the possibility to control it and to design it is quite limited and quite, quite difficult. And the second approach in, in which I and my team and my collaborators were going is the top bottom approach in which we are trying to uh, uh, control some bigger robots and take many of them and and uh, make them collaborating and uh, doing something useful. Of course, the robots must be miniaturized at the end. So in order to, to show you the idea, uh, uh, just, just to replace uh, 1,000 of words with a, single, uh, with a single film, probably you cannot see anything now. I will try to make it visible, sorry. Okay. 
it showed in the okay yeah, can you see no, it okay. yeah yeah perfect okay so so this is a, a film from 2014 maybe or 15 and uh, it's, it's called big hero six and uh, this is uh, one of uh, moments of, in the film uh, on the robotic conference expo as a kid is so showing uh, a new robot which is actually not a single robot but a collective robot made of uh, a number of, uh, of 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 small ones and, and they can reorganize to build uh, some more useful structures and it this somehow presents the the, the overall idea how, how we think this these kind of structures can behave and how can be to what they can be used uh, to. Uh, the interesting fact is that if the film that the director consulted the, uh, the, the, the this uh, scientific part of the of the of these kind of structures with the team in Carnegie Mellon University who are actually working on this kind of uh, uh, shape shifting structures. Uh, so this is a quite quite nice story. So I, I will not show you the, the whole film because it's too long. Um, I will just move on. Uh, so uh, this sort of uh, technology is sometimes called programmable matter because, uh, because of their uh, expected capabilities, uh, uh, meaning that uh, it should be split into a hardware, meaning there are small robots that can, that can do some physical work on the, on the microscopic side, uh, uh, microscopic scale and, and being able to Process information, exchange it, and um, and uh, connect, disconnect, and it is split into software which uh, can be exchanged if needed, and uh, describes the the behavior of, of such robots. And despite the fact that uh, that this kind of uh, ideas are actually all the whole life uh, works on self self organization, but also in uh, it was known in the uh, science, uh, science fiction films and literature for decades now. Uh, the, the real efforts to create such a structures uh, come back to early 2000s, uh, in which the modular robotic communities started to build uh, uh, like a self-reconfigurable self modular robots in order to embody this idea. And uh, it was 2010 more or less, and uh, it was 2002, and 2010 is more or less when I started to be involved in these kind of topics. Now we have 2021, and uh, the question is why we don't see these kind of structures or these kind of systems on the on the shop shelves. And uh, the reason is that um, it is it is a difficult problem, and there are two main issues uh, related to to creating uh, these kind of systems. One of uh, one of them is uh, the fact that the robots needs to be miniaturized below one millimeter scale in order to make it uh, reasonable to, to think about these structures as, as a material. So, uh, so this is a, a kind of a design problem to, to create such a small miniaturized robots with all the equipment on board, like, uh, uh, like information processing, information exchange, powering, uh, docking systems, reconfiguration uh, capabilities, meaning the creation of some um, mechanical interactions between the uh, neighboring modules. But the second, uh, second uh, difficulty comes uh, from the fact that we need to consider millions of millions of such robots, robots working together. And uh, this is, uh, uh, these kind of problems are related to programming them. And th there are distributed algorith algorithms that are necessary to govern the behavior of, of such systems. And uh, I will more focus on this uh, distributed algorithms part or programming part, but I will show you a sort of uh, uh, assumptions that we are doing about the, the robotic systems that, uh, that uh, we use in our uh, models of programming models. And uh, these kind of uh, robots, um, they do not possess uh, moving parts, uh, which is suitable when we think about, when you think about miniatur miniaturizing them. And there are certain uh, designs that uh, uh, that operate on the principle of controlling mag magnetic or electric fields at the at the surface of, of, of such robots. You can see three of such de designs, and the idea is that when you control, for instance, the electric uh, charge at, at, at the electrodes at the surface of of two interacting modules, you can create a, a attraction attraction of, of uh, repulsion force 
but also you can create a rolling net force uh, in the shearing direction between between the two modules so it's such that they can roll one over one other so this creates a basic uh, or fundamental uh, uh, mechanism that uh, allows us to to create a mechanical work at the at the microscopic scale at the interaction between the two modules mm, so but but there are many other um tasks that were considered uh, by by the by the by the community uh, of shape shapeshifters and there are two basic ones. one is just cr to create uh, shape shifting sculptures i would say so given uh, some initial configuration you would like to reorganize the positions of the of the robots in order to create some other overall configurations and there are many works on, on that uh, another another sort of topics is uh, on collective actuation, which uh, tries to make an interaction of the ensemble as a, the whole structure made of robots with the external world. And uh, there are some ideas how to create a, a kind of actuators out of out of the small robots. Uh, so, but but uh, this this sort of ideas uh, they are not very scalable, meaning that either they can reconfigure, reconfigure very slowly uh, with when, the, when the number of interacting modules increases, or they are too weak to, to be at all considered at, as actuators at the microscopic scale. So our idea, to our, our approach is to make some realistic assumptions about the, the adopted designs of modular robots and focus on this scalability uh, issue, meaning that we'd like to uh, maintain the uh, some desired properties of the whole systems when we will increase the number of uh, interacting robots and uh, uh, and we'll be focused not only at, on a ge geometrical rec reconstruction or changing the overall shapes but also on some mechanical constraints that, that come into play and uh, these basic assumptions that we are thinking about is uh, are, are the, the assumptions about uh, what sort of interaction physical interactions can be done between the robots so this can be as i mentioned the net force that can be produced out of this in, uh, electrostatic controlling the electrostatic uh, charge, charging of the electrodes and also about some programmistic system that can is created by the robotic system this is a fully distributed system with only local interactions available so this creates a sort of uh, network of uh, computers that are connected only with uh, with the local neighbors and they can uh, exchange the communicates between them and uh, out of all of this only with this we need to prepare a system that that will do some useful uh, mechanical work or useful reconfiguration as an ensemble uh, as an ensemble so we uh, followed some three main research directions which i will not cover fully uh, these are uh, scalable actuators that can when, when you increase the number of modules, the, the, the actuator will be stronger and stronger. And uh, there are another uh, avenue which we, in which we are going is to create some a reconfiguration from some initial shape into the, a desired shape that uh, will scale well, uh, that the reconfiguration time will scale well with the increasing number of robots again. And uh, some new uh, developments uh, that I will, I'm going to show you now uh, today uh, is about uh, predicting mechanical failures by the the entire robot uh, by, by its by the robot itself so it is not uh, um, offline computation that will be done but the uh, modular robots uh, meaning the the ensemble of uh, independent robots that can only communicate with their neighbor neighbors will be able to predict its uh, mechanical failure one step in advance like here so so uh, how how I, I would like to pose the problem is that uh, when we think about changing the, the shape the, the change of the shape is uh, uh, governed by so-called reconfiguration reconfiguration uh, it's uh, one this the change from one shape to another consists of many many reconfiguration steps and each step consists of uh, just releasing some of the connections then moving the some modules for to another place and then reconnecting them again and so most of these operations are potentially dangerous 
and we cannot predict in advance whether uh, I mean, you, you cannot just sense it whether after releasing some of the connections, the, the structure will collapse or not. I mean, collapse whether it will just, if you release these connections, whether, let's say, these connections will be overloaded and will collapse, or maybe the whole structure, the structure as a whole will just tilt and fall down. Uh, so, uh, so in particular, uh, the, the, our recent re research uh, that we did with uh, Femto Insti ST Institute were to uh, to uh, to um, model a special particular modular robotic system that is developed in the in Femto ST. It is a blinky block robot, and it is a kind of Lego block robot that uh, is enhanced with some magnetic connections on the sides and on the top as well. And there are some connections that allows the robot to uh, interact with the neighbors, uh, meaning the exchange that communicates and uh, sends their presence. Uh, so we thought that it is a good uh, a model to, 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 be, to be studied and to check the, um, the algorithms that we are trying to propose and, and check it physically on, on physical experiments. So there, are, there were two failure mechanics that were considered. One were uh, to check whether after adding some module to the structure, whether the remaining uh, connections will be uh, safe or they will be overloaded. Or after adding a new module to the structure, whether the whole structure will tilt and collapse or not. So, the, so such a problem to, to be posed. And our approach was to, uh, to build a, a, to build a mathematical model of the robot itself memorized by the by this distribute, distributed system. So uh, in, we can think about this that the stru structure as a whole will, will be a kind of distributed digital digital twin of itself. And uh, if the if the structure if we think about the structure as able to um, attain any possible shape, it can be a digital digital twin of every possible shape maybe. So this is a particular point of view that perhaps could be emphasized uh, in this occasion. Uh, so the, the model that we considered was a simple uh, beam model with six, uh, three or six degrees of freedom, with, depending whether it is a 2D or 3D case. In our case, it was a 3D case. So, so each connection between the two, model, two, two modules were modeled by the, by the, three, uh, by the six degree of, degrees of freedom and the, and the beam model. And also uh, we, uh, we uh, assumed some sort of uh, interactions with the with the support uh, of of this of this sort. I will not go into this detail now because I don't have time. Uh, uh, so what is interesting here that uh, after all we end up with uh, with a, pro a problem that is posed in the form of, of the uh, equili uh, equilibrium equations, or, or and we need to solve a system of nonlinear equations in order to determine whether there's some uh some uh some connections will be overloaded or not so this is the problem to be to be to be solved and just uh as a first choice we we used a very well known uh, uh weighted jacobi iterative solution scheme to solve it uh which has uh, this particular advantage that can it can be quite directly implemented on a distributed system of this kind because it only relies on the local communication, which can be exchanged easily between the, the neighboring connecting robots. And, uh, but it requires a huge number of iterations to, con to convert. Uh, so this is what we have implemented. And also we, we uh, some, uh, assumed some uh, failure mechanism, but I will not uh, comment on that right now. And uh, after, after all, we implemented this on, on these kind of robots and tested this physically so I, I will show you a short short film maybe uh, how how it performed i hope you you can see this so it has been published recently in one of the top robotic journals uh, okay so this is uh, this is the uh is it moving no hi uh, uh, yeah now it's moving uh, we saw the video playing yeah Okay, so so this is one one of the test cases, uh, a kind of a cantilever case, and why oh, it's 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 stopping from time to time. Uh, so uh, and this is the uh, filing criterion whether it will uh, tilt and and 
fall down or, or not. So it is stopping from time to time. And it, it has been uh, uh, physically demonstrated that the criterion worked well. So I will, I will move to some overloading criterion. Might be some more complex here. Okay, so you see uh, each blink is uh, some number of uh, weighted Jacob iterations that, has, that are being computed. And you, you see that real time in minutes. So <laughs> you can see that it, for this particular uh, robotic system, it takes a huge amount of time to compute the, uh, the final solution and, and then to determine whether the connections are overloaded or not. So after some arbitrary number of iterations, we, we just uh, stopped the computations and, and then uh, we could uh, see whether the system predicted uh, its behavior, the plant, the reconfiguration behavior correctly or not. So you can see that, okay, the, the, the position of breakage was, was uh, predicted properly, but it takes uh, uh, some enormous amount of time, right? So this was uh, the reason uh, you know, why we at all considered a future um, extension of this idea. And uh, we, as a first step, we just thought, okay, there are some well-known uh, algorithms that perform much, much better, like a conjugate gradient solver. And in, th in this case, uh, we had to get rid of contact conditions because uh, we wanted to keep it simple and uh, the, linear, the uh, contact conditions uh, created the system nonlinear, being nonlinear. Uh, so we wanted to just to solve the linear system of equations by conjugate gradient solver. And in a in, we implemented this in a, in a distribution, distributed version, which required uh, a bit modif modification of the, of the standard conjugate gradient solver because we had to propagate some uh, sort of scalar information uh, across the whole system and then collect some information uh, from the system uh, to, to, to perform the CG uh, step. Uh, for that reason, we had to create a spanning tree and collect this information over the spanning tree, which made the standard uh, mm, uh, complexity estimates for CG solver um, a bit modified by the depth of this uh, tree. So we can see here how, how CG sol solver perform versus the weighted Jacobi solver. So we can see that uh, for even a relatively small number of modules, uh, like 16 modules, the weighted Jacobi solver converges like, like this. This is a relative error of the, with respect to some grand true results. And CG solver for uh, with some Jacobi preconditioner for 500 modules behave, behaves even better for, for this small case. So you can see it's a huge improvement, which is to some extent confirmed by the by this uh, more theoretical estimations on, on the complexity about execution time and but not only about the time. So this has been as, as I mentioned recently published in. Uh, uh, in, uh, actually, I haven't mentioned this, but this was another paper uh, in, in one of the top robotic conferences that has been uh, published last year. Um, so uh, as a conclusion, uh, there are many avenues to, to go into, and, uh, and I hope there are some uh, places where we could collaborate and think about uh, finding the, the, the interfaces at which we can collaborate, especially I, I saw this uh, uh, pr presentation of Olivier from the group of Christian Durier, quite interesting uh, on soft robots. Perhaps uh, the soft, uh, the assumptions of soft uh, robots uh, creates even uh, um, more difficulty to modeling. In that case, we we, we assume the linear models, but but if if you think about soft. Uh, robots interacting, it creates a really big challenge. And uh, for, from my perspective, uh, what I thought might be very interesting is to focus more on task planning and interacting with environments. And, uh, and uh, uh, what is nice is to take advantage that the, the robotic system is completely um, collective, it, it is distributed. So look more at uh, the this collective knowledge acquisition and inference, uh, which is, I think, quite difficult and challenging because uh, you cannot dream that each particular module will 
uh, memorize all possible interactions that that the system came came with, and so we need you need to distribute that information across the the whole society of robots, and um, and this requires further research to 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 figure out how to do this the best. Uh, so thank you very much for for your inter for your attention, and uh, I'm, I'm open for answering any questions if, if there are any. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Jakub. Is there is uh, is there is any any question in the chat? Uh, so yeah, I, I don't see. It. First, uh, you know the the pictures that you just just showed on the you know the fire fire, fire hands, right? And I never saw never saw that. It's quite uh, quite um, inspiring to to make the connection between that and 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 I would say uh, yeah, the, the robots and 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 the kind of. Uh, uh, of I would say collaborating robots as you are showing, I've got so if there is no uh, please uh, anyone you can obviously unmute and and ask directly your questions. I've got uh, I've got already already one so um, one which is maybe more a remark and that's maybe what you said, uh, Jakub. It's that it sounds like you know if 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 we get closer between your work and what is done like uh, a bit like in the uh, Olivier's team uh, on soft robotics because it means you have quite it could be considered as less degrees of freedom because you have a, a limited number of bricks and it could actually make things on a computation standpoint maybe a bit faster a bit more efficient compared to uh, usual i mean usual fem where you, you might have uh, quite a lot of degrees of freedom so that's it was mm -hmm. maybe just one thought but just um, and the, i got a question on top of the of the thought it's um, here you, you showed uh, you know, predicting, for instance, using, using the different bricks, if it was going to break or not. Or, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. But I was wondering. Uh, so I guess it's on the on the roadmap that that you have on, on your research roadmap. But uh, you, you would aim at making the, those kind of reconfiguration automatic. That's what you, you would you would like to achieve, like bricks uh, automatically reconfigurating for any purposes. Yes, this is this is true because the the, the system that uh, are is available at Femtest is, is more static. Yeah, it's yes. reconfigurable, but it is not self-reconfigurable, mm -hmm. so that it cannot move uh, by its own. Uh, but there are such systems uh, designed in the uh, in in the world in other groups. They are big so far, but uh, in, in sometimes or also in Femtest they are they are currently developing the. The robotic systems that will be miniaturized and also being able to connect disconnect on demand. So it is a first step to make it uh, fully reconfigurable, self reconfigurable. Uh, and about your your comment uh, on uh, uh, the, the first comment yeah, on, on the degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So if you consider that a single block will be soft, it will involve uh, lots of degrees yeah. of freedom by by itself. Which you cannot usually control make, unless you just make the softness controllable. But usually, this is the part of the system that you need to take into account, but you cannot control fully. And uh, and and then you need to work on the on the parts of the actuators or that that uh, are at your disposal in order to make the whole robot behave as you wish. Mm -hmm. So the the amount of uh, degrees of number of degrees of freedom probably is. Uh, is uh, similar to what soft robotics guys are are need to deal with, mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps the number of uh, actuators is possibly larger than they have. So, and okay. also the the uh, yeah. the possibility of control is is lower because you have a distributed system. You, you don't have a, a centralized control on them. You need to always operate in a distributed fashion. Okay, thanks. I have another question that comes to my mind, but I'll, I'll first read the one from Pierre Yves. Uh, Pierre Yves said, "Great talk. Good. Could you remind us how to how you define stabi uh, stability?" Sorry. Uh, so saying stability, I only had in mind uh, the fact that whether the the system will fall down or not, or perhaps if you and uh, if you want to call it stability, also whether the connection will be will be overloaded or not so we we have a kind of uh overloading condition here which is just, just based on some measurement that we did for the magnetic uh, force that attraction force and also on some geometrical uh, properties of the of the of the modules uh, uh, 
and and this worked quite quite well for in our case. I mean, this this simple criterion. But Thank it is you are uh, Thank you, Jacob. Uh, and and for the loss of balance, uh, it was based on the fact uh, that that there actually there were two approaches to detect whether it will lose balance or not. If the ground is uh, just flat and it all, everything is loaded by the great gravitational force, then you can have a quite simple detection whether the supports create, a, I mean, whether the center of mass of the system uh, and when you put the, the gravitational force, whether it hits inside the convex hull of the support or not. And this can be detected in a distributed fashion quite uh, quickly, and we did so. But in more general case, when you have a multiple support which are not planar, it is not at all possible to detect anything. It depends on the whole dynamics of the system. And even, I mean, it's a huge problem known for the contact mechanics community that it is non-unique and sometimes for some model assumptions, it is not existing solution. Uh, so um, for that case, we for the general case, we created a model-based approach in which we first es estimate whether the structure will collapse or not. So we are solving the same system uh, of, I mean, the, the same system of you know, nonlinear equation with contact conditions now. And when when the the system will just tilt, uh, we'll will end up with a number of contact points uh, at the end of the simulation which will tell us which of the po contact points will be will be in contact in the end. And then we only need to determine whether they are creating a, a non-planner. Uh, and if any, there are any three points that are non-planner. If there are such a system of points, there is such a system of points, then the system is stable. If not, if there, these, are, these are collinear or a single point, building point, then, then you know that it is an unstable configuration and, and you can expect a loss of balance. So these were the, these two strategies that we took there. But I, I, of course, I couldn't just even overview this in this short presentation. It's very clear. Thank you very much, Jacob. Thanks a lot. Any, any last question from the audience? I was uh, I was just thinking about you know model roller reduction as well that could be uh, pretty useful because as soon as you see especially if you know each uh, each uh, of your robot uh, parts is actually deformable there you could actually use quite uh, extensively uh, mm -hmm. MOR approaches but uh, yes for 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 modeling a single robot when, when mm -hmm. it is uh, deformable but as I said for for the whole structure is only it could only work if you limit yourself to a, some prescribed number of configurations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, you cannot cover all the complexities that you could possibly achieve. Thanks a lot. Uh, anyway, Jacob, thanks for, for Thank your you. replies. Thank you thanks for, for the presentation. Thanks, actually, to all the presenters. I don't know, Stefan, if you want to say a few last words for and concluding words for this uh, for this uh, dri driven, uh, driven workshop se session. I can actually take again just. Yeah. Yeah. OK, perfect. Oh, you can hear me. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> so let me see. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Let's see if that thing works or not. Application. I have no idea if that's going to work or not. Uh, screen one, screen two, share. At, at least All it's right. starting. Looks starting. Yeah. yeah. And we can see, I, I can see myself, so it sounds good. Yeah, good. So, okay. Uh, do you see something here? Yeah. And still here. Perfect. Cool. You can see it? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot. So, yes, uh, I just wanted to thank uh, all the speakers of the session, obviously. Uh, and I tried to make a little summary, nothing really new, but um, yeah, at least so that we have something to think about uh, in case we're not thinking enough. So, you know, um, we had a uh, talk by uh, by Johan, who explained uh, what's going on in biomechanics and what I remembered is something that I also think is very important is the verification and validation with a certain goal. So assuming that we have a model at the top, we're trying to solve something and we get some solution. Uh, then we had some discussions about by Alban about uh, neural networks and reduce other models as well. I mean, in some other contexts, in, at least in my team. 
uh, which could enable real-time simulation. And then these real-time simulations could be used as surrogate models to calibrate and identify the models. So maybe to find the, the parameters or maybe even to identify the best model. So with or, or without this acceleration, the neural networks and the reduce of the models can allow that. And the nice thing is that, uh, well, as a global team, I think everybody's moving in a direction of trying to take ex experiments and putting them inside the, the learning process, as um, Pierre-Yves was, was showing, um, and to put that into some sort of learning so that the model can be updated and that at some point we can use it for soft robotics or for non-so soft robotics, but some nice robotics that Jakub was showing. So whether it is from the defrost team with Olivier and Christian or uh, inside the uh, framework of uh, Jakub with Fempo ST, it seems like uh, this uh, sort of acceleration technique is, is really useful. And uh, what came to my mind is uh, that perhaps we could work towards something probably that you're already doing, but uh, I'm very good at uh, uh, as we say in French, enfoncer les portes ouvertes. So a set of common benchmarks maybe would be nice. Uh, maybe crowdsourcing the training data would be also nice. I have no idea uh, if someone has thought about that, know how to do it. And uh, I also know that uh, Arnaud with Jack has already started working on a coupling between Phoenix, which en enables to calculate directly tangent stiffnesses and residuals in an algebraic manner into SOFA directly so that new material models can be implemented very fast. And another alternative would be to go for ACEFEM or ACEGEN or maybe even GETFEM, uh, which are alternatives to Phoenix. Uh, and Jakub didn't talk about them, but he is an expert in those, in those things. And uh, currently, uh, Thomas Levin, who is a, an intern from LMT in Cachon, is, is working on that in the context of the rest position of the, of the breast for surgical training. And planning. So that's it. So on that, uh, I again, would like to thank SOFA and the whole consortium to allow us to have this little mini workshop inside the big SOFA week. Week, and I hope this is just the beginning of well, not the beginning, the, the continuation of a long, <laughs> of a long con co collaboration because we've been knowing each other for a long time and a lot of outputs already out. And that's it. I just want to thank everybody again for for everything. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Stéphane. Uh, so maybe just a, a conclusion for the conclusion. Uh, I'm just going to uh, you know, show you a bit uh, the agenda for tomorrow. So to, that was the, the planning of today. And so tomorrow will take will indeed take place the what we call symposium of SOFA, which is a more I would say uh, scientific oriented event. There is actually companies and mostly academic uh, presenting their latest achievement with uh, SOFA. Uh, so it will be most, really mostly around simulations, but you'll see robots, you'll see uh, VR, AR applications, so uh, haptics, also companies that will, be, that will be there. So do not hesitate to join. Everything is, again, free, open, and so on. So if you uh, did not receive the link, do not hesitate to write us. Thanks again, Stefan, for coordinating the event. And uh, yeah, so hope to see you tomorrow online for the symposium and the days after for the technical committee, if you're interested to see how it works under the hood for uh, managing uh, the uh, technical project and open source project like, like SOFA. Thanks a lot. Have a good uh, evening or night or morning, depending where you're located on. And see you tomorrow, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay.